Hello, welcome to our live. Um, we're going to be talking about the unconditioned state and this is gonna be a really useful conversation for you. If you tend to feel like you need to do something in order to deserve happiness or joy or like, oh, once I achieve this thing, then I can do X, Y, Z. So, hello. Um, Sasha's going to be, okay, now he's here. Um, yeah. So Sasha, you have to, yeah, okay, you got it, yeah, cool. Uh, okay. There we go. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> How are you? How are you feeling? Oh, good. Thursdays are always tiring with the kids, but but we made it. Right, and you had a field trip yesterday or something, right? <laughs> yeah, awesome memory. No, it was a great field trip. Went to the Hayden Planetarium, got to oh. see, and it's it makes me feel like a kid again mm. there when I'm just mm. remembering. Oh yeah, we're on this tiny planet. And then I get to look over and see my students and they're like, wow, we're so small. The earth is amazing. All the other planets suck, like so bad to live on. One of the moons of Jupiter called Io, it has like volcanoes all over the surface and it's constantly erupting. Just a horrible place to be. Yeah. And so it reminds you like, wow, we got to take care of this place. We really do. We really need to sort that out. Yes. Well, I got a nice background here. Ooh. Ooh, organize cool. my very colorful everything wow hello everyone who's in here this is my first live with someone else ever. oh wow. oh i'm honored <laughs> how are you doing how's everything good. good yeah i'm excited to talk about this i've never really um i've never explored this topic before so i don't know if you want to just like introduce the unconditioned state yeah i mean so i thought a lot about this in walks because from my understanding of buddhist teaching and buddhist talks particularly you're not supposed to rehearse a speech or rehearse a dharma talk in any way you're supposed to let it flow in the moment which ensures that you're speaking from experience whatever that experience may be it always helps me to talk first about what conditioned things are what what are conditioned states right so we can map out the space and i'll pose the question to you first what do you think a conditioned state is <laughs> okay I, I like i like this philosophical um back and forth um for me i think like when you're in a conditioned state it's any time that you feel like mm, i'm trying to say it without using the word condition <laughs> like anytime there's um a necessity like there's an x to a y rather than just the y yeah if that makes sense, yeah? <laughs> exactly. And I would even go more broad than that. Like, conditioned states are most of the states that we spend our lives in. For instance, this Instagram Live is a conditioned state. Why? Because there are causes that preceded it that needed to happen. For instance, right. we needed to connect before. We both need Instagram. We right. needed to be here at the same time. And then when those causes disappear, the effect disappears, which is this live. So there's a cause, there's the effect, and the conditions that you know make this effect stay like our wi-fi and then eventually those dissolve and so then eventually the effect dissolves naturally and mm -hmm. most of our lives is filled with conditioned states like this shirt is a conditioned thing conditions yeah. brought it about people made this shirt and now it's on my body it's slowly deteriorating and then when the conditions that support its continued existence are gone then the shirt will go and we can kind of run this analysis on almost everything in our lives. Yeah, are, I was going to say this applies right? to everything, it feels like, you know? <laughs> right? Like, I, I'm a conditioned being, you're a conditioned being, and when right. the conditions are gone, we'll be gone. Yeah. And that's the way it is. We are in the realm of conditionality. Mm -hmm. and so that's what a conditioned state is, something that can be brought about. But then strangely, Buddhism talks a lot about unconditioned things, unborn things, deathless things. And given our prior discussion on, well, wait, if most things are conditioned, then they can't be deathless because by definition, everything that is conditioned, that is brought about, comes to an end. Things that are born die. Like that's a yeah. guarantee, right? If you're born, you die, right? Yeah. If you're born, you decay. 
And so what is something unconditioned? The problem is, how can we even talk about it? Because any metaphor right. you would get would- <laughs> I mean, it's like this thing of philosophy as well. This happens right? a lot. <laughs> any metaphor you would give is like, oh, it's like this. It's like that. You would be comparing it to a conditioned thing. Yeah. So, that, right? So you just still wouldn't quite be talking about it. Thankfully, though, I love Buddhism in the fact that it's not a fan of mystical speak. So it mm -hmm. does give a definition of sorts, right? In, in Christian dialogue, there's this thing called apophatic discourse, which is you talk about divinity through negation. So God is not limited. God is et cetera, et cetera. Because you can't talk about what it is, but you can talk about what it isn't. So the, the Buddhists say, and this is from like the Samyutta Nikaya, which is a collection of Buddhist readings, uh, that the unconditioned state is simply the absence of three things. It's the absence of what are known as the three poisons. And those are greed, hatred, and delusion. Mm -hmm. So once you get rid of those, you are abiding in the unconditioned state. So it's easy to define what conditionality is. It's things that are born and then die. Talking about the unconditioned state is harder, but we can talk about it as a lack of something. Something yeah. that doesn't need to be brought about on its own something that just is but to experience what just is you need to take away the things that veil it from you mm -hmm. the things that veil it from shining forth i just talked for so long what, what are your thoughts on everything i just said <laughs> i'm just kind of like soaking this all in i've never i've never explored this concept before as i said um and i've never like done a particularly deep dive into buddhist teachings i've worked with buddhist meditation so i've i've felt ex the experience of these teachings in a way but i haven't like sat down and you know kind of sat with the buddhist philosophy and so i think it's really interesting um my only like reference point <laughs> is when i did a project about existentialism mm. and basically there's this whole like <laughs> There's this big dilemma in existentialism that talks about who is the other. And so like, like you can't prove who the other is if you can't prove who you are. <laughs> so so it just like when you when you talked about the conditioned state and the unconditioned state, I was like, ah, this it sounds like a classic um like philosophical kind of um what's like the word like dichotomy yeah, maybe like, or duality. Yeah, dichotomy, duality. yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. No, exactly. I mean, cause then if you go deeper, the paradox the paradoxes start to emerge where it's that we right. only actually understand unconditionality through conditionality. Yeah. Right. Like it's not like there are two separate things in two separate worlds. The unconditioned <laughs> is made manifest through the conditioned realm. And so, okay. So now I have a question. Would, um, would Buddhists say that this, um, like this conditionality and this unconditionality only exists in the physical plane? Oh, no way. No, I mean, most most conditioned things start in the mental plane, right? Like right. the reason we're talking now, this is a physical act, but yeah. it was tension that brought us here, which is, you know, a mental act, yeah. right? It was like deep intentions that like, hey, we should do this. And then it manifested physically, mm -hmm. right? And then I have a great story though about unconditioned versus conditioned that I, I go back to a lot. It's from this really early Zen writer, Dogen. And he wrote this text called the Genjo Kon, and it's probably one of my favorite Buddhist texts. And the story goes, I hope I don't butcher it. Uh, there's these two, <laughs> there's a master and a student, and the master is fanning himself. And then the student walks up, up to the master, trying to best him, you know, trying to trick him in some way. Mm -hmm. He's like, master, the wind is everywhere. The wind is all pervading. Why are you fanning yourself? And then the, the master says, you understand that the wind is everywhere but you don't understand that it's all pervading. And the, t and the student says, well, wait, what do you mean by that? And then the master just keeps fanning himself. It's like at first glance, like what are they even talking about? <laughs> and it relates to the unconditioned and conditioned like this. Don't worry, I know I'm, you're like, what on earth is an example? <laughs> just because the wind is everywhere doesn't mean you don't have to fan yourself to bring about a breeze. Right, yeah. And similar with the, un just because reality is, perfectly pure, bright and clear, like undifferentiated awareness doesn't mean that your engagement in the world of differentiation is, is useless. Mm -hmm. And moreover, the only way you can know the unconditioned as an object is through the conditioned. So the only way yeah. that you can kind of understand that, hey, there's wind, hey, there's a breeze 
is if you disturb the primordial state a little bit. You shake it up. You notice the reverberations within it. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So, like, like I, my previous question about, you know, does this unconditioned state in the, un, in the conditioned state, is this a dynamic in the physical plane? Like, do you think, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what Buddhist, what Buddhism says about, like, don't other dimensions. Speak for or... Buddhism, for the record. Yeah, I, no. I think this is my interpretation, for, obviously. For sure, for sure, for sure. But like, um, I guess my question is, you know, a lot of the things that we talk about or a lot of the things that we can conceptualize do come from the sense of polarity. You know, like I can like I can perceive you right now because you're not me, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so like I'm me, you're you. So I can see you because I can't actually like really fully see myself, you know, on a physical level. Um, so like i guess my question comes down to you know is this dichotomy between the conditioned and the unconditioned something that has to do with like the nature of being physical or you know when we transcend into maybe like energetic non-physical planes do we still experience this un non-conditioned and unconditioned state or is it simply the unconditioned state i don't know maybe this is like very existential no, I don't no, know. Like, as someone <laughs> who has not transcended into right. a permanent unconditioned yeah, like, I, who knows? <laughs> But what it, it seems like to me is a lot of Buddhism is written in a soteriological way, which just means that mm -hmm. it's written in a way to enlighten you. It's very pragmatic. The writings are there to give you a map of your mind and cognition and for you to follow that and become enlightened. And whether or not these teachings are an actual map of like this is what there is in the world or whether they are just describing things that are helpful for you to wake up from this delusion not really, really sure True. but the way that they explain it is that it's something experiential and that language really can't mm -hmm. handle it the best mm -hmm. example i can give is you've sat in meditation i'm sure anyone who watches this has also sat in meditation it's not exactly active what you're doing, right? Because you're sitting still. So if someone looked at you, they'd be like, well, you're definitely not active right now. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it's definitely not passive, right? If you've experienced meditation, it's there's a lot going on. So it's neither active, it's neither passive, it's kind of something in between. Mm -hmm. And similarly, in a lot of Buddhist meditations, you're asked to observe sensations without trying to push them away and without trying to crave their, you know, perpetuation. And so you're again kind of stuck in this middle space. And so this is a roundabout answer to say the dichotomy between conditioned and unconditioned, I think it's something that has to be felt. Yeah. And then eventually it might just dissolve. Right. Yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Like in the end, there are so many things that we can't actually explain or put names to, you know, and and now, like before we had this call, we you asked me, you know, how is how is color therapy going to relate to the unconditioned exactly. state? And your name, but too. Not... Unconditioned colors. Oh, sorry, what were you saying? Oh, no, saying and your name as well, unconditioned colors. You have to tell, like, what is that? How does that connect to any of this, do you think? Yeah, so, I mean, well, the thing that's coming to my mind right now is, like, yeah, colors for example you know there have been studies about how certain colors affect your nervous system how your body responds how your mood responds how colors can provoke certain thoughts and experiences and memories you know um but i always tell people like there is no universal meaning to any of this <laughs> like we can we can try to make universal meanings right but for example if we take black and white mm. like in western cultures black means death and then in Eastern cultures, white means death, you know? And so, you know, these things like, like color has such a significance to kind of like the context that it's in, mm. you know, and it's very much based on the perspective and the way that people feel those colors um, according to how they see the world, you know? And so I think it's interesting because like colors in a way don't have conditions like yeah I, I i guess in a way they do because you know in order to perceive them you have to have certain receptors in your eyes yeah, cool, cool. Um, <laughs> you know things like that but but beyond that like in terms of what colors actually mean i think you know you can kind of make them mean what you want them to mean i mean of course it doesn't negate the ways that colors have been shown to affect your physical body but on other levels of, you know, the way that you think or the way that you relate to color or the way that you feel, um, 
you can kind of make whatever you want with that, you know? And so I think there's something beautiful about that is like, you don't have to have a lot of information in order to understand colors. Mm. You just have to be open to feel, you know? And so that that's what I thought about as you were saying, you know, we don't really have words to talk about the unconditioned state because I mean, it's something that you just have to feel. And that's what I always say to my clients. Like, I can tell you all of this research about all the different colors, but like the most important thing is that you feel that color and that you kind of, you feel that, you connect with that, you become aware of that, and then you can compare that with the research. But um, but yeah, just like what you said about words really made me think about that because um, I see color as a language that really does like liberate the mind from concepts, you know? And from this need to like have this, I don't know, like this solid understanding or this solid meaning for things, you know? Um, yeah, I can talk forever, so. <laughs> I, I, love, I love what you said, liberated from concepts, right? Yeah. Which is, yeah. I mean, and that's what it's all about. Concepts are like the greatest tool ever. They're so helpful. Yeah. But if you want to walk, walk a path of any kind, you need to eventually kind of let go of them mm -hmm. and not let them disappear forever, but just see them as what they are. No, I like that that a lot and in the same way when we're talking about the unconditioned it's fun to talk about for some people it might be fascinating for other people it yeah. might be off-putting because it right. seems so far from your lived experience which is why in the buddhist writings that i read it's mostly about just shut up and practice like yeah. your philosophy should only be so far as your practice and you shouldn't right. over philosophize because then you'll forget like oh actually I'm not that far along the experiential path. Mm. That's really right. And there's a danger to that, wow. which, which is cool about colors, though, because colors like just immediately everyone has a different visceral yeah. sense, visceral reaction to a different color. Right. Exactly. You can't intellectualize. You can intellectualize it later. But the first thing is the experience of the color. Right. Exactly. You know, and I've had like I particularly notice like certain patterns. But one one pattern that I've noticed, for example, is like a lot of people think red is intense, you know, and they're like, it's too intense. I don't like it. I can't imagine myself wearing this color. I feel like it calls too much attention. And not every person who has said this to me, but a, a good portion of these people have normally had some kind of issue with anxiety, mm. with, you know, feeling safe in their bodies, um, things like that, because red stimulates your nervous system. It makes you feel grounded. It makes you feel present. It helps your blood um, circulate. So like it, it helps, it increases your heartbeat. So then, you know, your blood is circulating, you're feeling like active, you know? Um, and so it's interesting because it's like, you can no notice how people respond to things based on their experiences, you know? Mm -hmm. And based on how their, like whatever habits have been formed in their body, they will respond from that point rather than, oh, I just don't like that color. Like that can happen as well. But there are some people who have like a very strong felt experience of like, I don't want to see that. I don't want to be near that. I don't want yep, it. Yep. Like, I want it to not exist, you know? And so it's interesting because like, I can sit here and talk for hours about the different research about color, but it doesn't change someone's lived experience, you no. know? <laughs> so, and what I like about color is that w when you sit in meditation, if perhaps your nervous system isn't ready for it, or mm -hmm. perhaps it's too advanced, Mm -hmm. A lot of things can come up. It can be kind of a chaotic internal experience. Sure. But sure. colors are cool because they're very grounded because you can kind of pinpoint, oh, the color red makes me feel yeah. X and I don't like that. And then you can work with that a bit more tangibly than if you sit down to do, let's say, breath meditation and, you, and you're confronted with many, many things, memories and whatnot. It's hard to then go back and dissect that because it might have just been yeah. so overwhelming. Exactly. Yeah. And that's actually, I mean, that's something that I discovered, like, when I started working with, well, when I started painting intuitively was the same time that I started meditating. Mm. And there was a point in time where I was painting every day and meditating every day. But then there was a point in time where I couldn't do that, you know? And so I remember what, what happened at that time was that um, I just started visualizing colors. Like I started seeing them and it, it happened like very naturally. But then from there I explored it and I was like, wow, you know, like when I get into these thought loops, or when I'm meditating and I feel maybe like overwhelmed by certain thoughts, mm. if I put those into like a color, like a bubble, a cloud, whatever you want, I'm like, I actually don't have to bother with this, you know? Like I don't have to be in like some internal debate yep. <laughs> with myself, you know? Yep. 
and the color just kind of like brings what i always say to people is like colors bring us straight to the feeling um because it's like it's really hard not to feel something in response to a color like i think you'd have to try not to do that yeah but I, I, I think though you do i think if you brought this to most people on the street in new york for instance i i feel like that visceral reaction to a color would be hidden by many other things really? Actually, i think you might have to peel back or at least get them to a certain degree of stillness but on the point of like putting your thought loops in colors funny you say this so i was just at a, the rubin museum in new york with a friend last weekend and it's a tibetan buddhist museum essentially mm -hmm. and what's amazing about the tibetan buddhists is that they kind of understood this idea that yeah emotions are very hard to deal with like anger how do i deal with my mm -hmm. anger how do i deal with desire so what they did is they made these deities and they made these deities with very intricate forms very specific colors and then they imbue that deity with all of the emotionality and so instead of just vaguely dealing with thoughts, you say this deity represents all of these emotions. So then you have something concrete and tangible to deal with. And it kind of externalizes it in the way that you said, were you like visualizing it as a circle or, or what were you doing? Well, at first, I mean, it, so for me, it was like this process of um, I was painting every day because I had a lot of things that I was coming to terms with within myself. And then I went across the country. I was staying with my uncle. I didn't bring any art supplies with me. And I was very angry at myself. I was like, why? Like, why did I purposely put myself in this situation where I can't do what I felt like I needed to do? Uh, um, and like through the process of being in that limited state, um, the first thing that happened was like, I started kind of like painting in my mind, but it wasn't a conscious thing. Like I was just walking down the street with my uncle. And then I, I, I felt this like sense of, I miss painting, I need to express this, like whatever. And then, yeah, like a, a painting, like kind of like an image came into my head of a painting, but abstract, you know, just sure. like colors. Sure. And then from there, you know, I started sitting with this. I was like, wait, like, I think there's something deeper here. You know, I don't think it's so much just about like, oh, I need to paint physically. You know, I think it's also just like allowing myself to think in colors, you know, at that time. Um, so this was, I mean, yeah, this was like, eight or nine years ago this is a long time ago but um yeah at that time i was working with a counselor and i remember i told her i was like i think in colors like i just discovered that i can think in colors you know that's cool and she was like yeah like some people do that and i was like oh cool um and so it, it sort of like became this exploration on like a personal level of like oh how can i like it came in an organic way and then little by little i was like okay like i think there's more i think there's more to like experience and explore in this and i've noticed that when i'm in a situation where i don't like understand what's happening or maybe i feel a little bit like oh this is really intense or this is really sad or this is really overwhelming um what i do is i just ask myself you know what color kind of represents the situation for me and that always helps me a lot to feel so much more grounded um rather than like oh, i need to understand or i, I, I don't know if i your question i feel no, like i no, just like that makes so that makes so much sense right because again any at least the way i see it which is a pretty analytical way that our whole experience is maybe six sensory doors and those doors are being contacted by the world and mm -hmm. when you're in not a traumatic experience per se but any kind of experience yeah. there's a lot of inputs and if you can just mentally put those all in a color or in a shape and then deal with that things become a lot more manageable yeah exactly and like you don't have to because like when you put things into a thought form you know of like oh this situation is xyz mm. then it's like you can constantly change what that thought is oh, that's and you can cool. go back and forth oh sorry what oh no i'm saying that's really cool yeah because it's more malleable if you just put a concept on it yeah yeah because like you can like we can debate until the end of time you know <laughs> like so it starts within ourselves of like oh, no, I'm not actually that angry, or no, I'm not actually that sad, you know, and we start to, like, compromise, and we start to, like, create stories in our head, mm -hmm. when in reality, all we have to do is feel it, you know, and, and I think that's, like, really the big thing with meditation is, like, just let it be and let it pass, like, it will pass if you just let it, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly, but I think that that's so hard because yeah. we spend most of our time not doing that, and I, and I, don't do that all the time. And, and it's amazing. I think I told you last time moving to New York City, it's almost as if the city perpetuates this idea that keep moving, don't feel yeah. drive, drive, drive. 
which gets you places. There's no doubt about it. But then I found, oh, it's very important to come back and process everything that's happened during a day, really mm -hmm. feel it instead of verbalizing it away, as you said. Because then, yeah, the words and the labels, like when you label something, you're kind of convinced that you've actually understood it. Yeah. But in fact, you just kind of shrouded it with a label, right? You've just hidden it with a label. Yeah, exactly. And it sort of like inspires the sense of like, oh, I don't have to deal with that anymore. Like, it's fine. Um, but, you know, something that I've been studying and something that I've seen in myself and with the people who I work with is that, like, what we really need to do is we just need to close the cycle. So, like, when I say that, I mean in terms of your nervous system. Like, if there's an activation in your nervous system, if there's something that happened, let's say, like, you're walking down the streets of New York City and someone comes up and punches you in the face, but you're, like, in a, a normal rush, you know? So, afternoon. Yeah, so, of course first like in a way that is a traumatic experience because someone just violated your sense of safety you know and that's basically like the essence of trauma like someone violates your sense of physical safety and so or emotional safety but like emotional and physical safety are very much intertwined you know for sure so so yeah like you're so you're like i'm in a rush i have to go to work <laughs> someone just punched me in the face you tell yourself whatever thing to just like move on from it but you, your nervous system never actually completed the cycle. So like you never actually fully felt what happened or were able to process the experience. And so what happens is that a lot of people like in the same way that, you know, if you've got a lot, a lot of stuff, you feel really cluttered, you know, like a cluttered closet. This is always the analogy I use. Um, like in the same way that it's just like overflowing, you can't find anything. Everything's a disaster. Um, it happens in our bodies as well. Like our bodies harbor those emotional experiences. And so like in that example that you provided with New York, it's just like, yeah, we're trained to basically disconnect from the body, which the body naturally is kind of in that meditative state if we let it, you know, that state of like, this is what's happening. Okay, let's let it go. You know, like, let's feel it. Let's be present with it. You know, like we, it's not like our body evolved to be in a hyper fast paced society yeah. you know but so, what you said our body is already like we're already in the unconditioned state it, i think that's exactly what you said but oh, we're just kind yeah. of brought out of it by yeah. external stress. i didn't i didn't think about no, it exactly, exactly. but it's a good it's not a bad thing i i don't think it should be portrayed as like one thing is better than right. the other it's just about like wisdom at least in the buddhist context is about discernment mm -hmm. and just discerning oh i've I'm riled up. Well, my nervous system is in an open loop right now. I yeah. haven't closed this experience from this afternoon, last week, last month, yeah. last year, you know? I, I love I love how you brought that full circle with the unconditioned state. I wasn't even, I just, I was talking and I didn't even realize, but it's true. Like your body really doesn't have like this, this sense of, oh, this is good or this is bad. Your body just has like, it has a memory chip, basically, you know what I mean? So whatever experiences you've had in the past, like you and I, we could experience the exact same thing. The exact same person in the same place could punch us in the face at the same time. And we could have a completely different reaction to that uh -huh. just because of the memory that our body holds, you know? And so I guess like in a way, there's no condition, like in terms of a concept of like your body responds as like, I should do this, I shouldn't do that. It's sort of more like, I need to feel this, you know, like I need to process this. And I feel like being present in meditation is very much about that as well. Like I just need to be present with this, you know? Yeah, I mean, the body gets rid of it on its own. Yeah. If you let body, the body mind system do its thing, observe the sensations. Yeah. I mean, there's all these stories on retreat, you know, people might shake, maybe that's what the body needs to let it out. Mm -hmm. The Buddhist method of getting rid of this is, is is a funny shift which i love describing as you we storyfy things quite a bit we make them about i e what happened to me and i think that's a really great highly adaptive way of seeing the world right like sure it, the i concept the self concept kind of integrates our you know disparate experience makes it manageable makes it easy to talk to other people but when we take that concept too seriously i think it can give us great harm so when we're in a meditative state and we just simply observe things as they arise and pass away without calling them to be part of our story in the sense that oh this is my pain in the leg yeah. instead it's there is a sensation in my leg let yeah. me watch it arise let me watch mm -hmm. it abide and let me let it 
pass away and watch it pass away. And if we do that with all the sensations in our body, at least I think that's how we get back to this unconditioned way of being, where, where we slowly shift from making it a story, making it personal, to making it perennial. Because as you said, like, no matter what happens to us in the day, I'll experience it differently than you on the level of our story, how it fits into our life narrative. However, what's yeah. similar though, is that something arises and something passes away. Everything's impermanent, everything's changing. And from my understanding of Buddhist meditative teachings, it's about making that shift and seeing everything is just impermanent as opposed to imbuing it with a narrative. Like that's the liberative viewpoint that brings you back down, out of conditionality, so to speak. Yeah, and as I listen to you say this, you know, like moving through your mind with this perspective of, oh, there's a sensation in my leg. I mean, that's how your body, that's your body's response. <laughs> you know, like your body has the same thing. It's like, there's a sensation in the leg. Okay, what, what can we do to sort this out? You know, and your body is a super intelligent system that sorts that out, you know? And so I think it's cool how, like as we connect with nature we connect with the simplicity of these teachings that you're sharing i'm not and of course you know just a disclaimer to everyone simplicity is not the same as easy you know um <laughs> they're so hard they're just what what i say is like the methods are straightforward and simple but the experience is rich right yeah and it's conceptually light to what i love about early buddhist teachings is that con they're, they're very conceptually light mm -hmm. very bare bones there's not mm -hmm. a lot you have to get your head around and the methods are simple, but then that's where it ends. The experiences are rich and deep, and it takes discipline and rigor to actually practice in this way. But yeah, as you said, it's it's straightforward what to do. Yeah, and it's incredibly practical because what you're saying is like, it's the natural response in a way of, yeah, your body in an unconditioned state. Like, I mean, your body will still respond the way that it does, yeah. but it's without the mental story and like the chaos and you know, what happens to a lot of people, for example, is like when they share their story, if they've had a traumatic experience or something that's difficult for mm. them, like they share that story, their nervous system gets activated. And what happens is that they can actually re-traumatize themselves through doing that because the body doesn't really know what's happening. It's like you're reliving things. It's like the same thing where your brain doesn't know <laughs> imagination and reality. Yep. So imagine that you're remembering what happened and you're telling that story story and now your nervous system is responding to that of like is it happening again yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know it's, <laughs> so it's it's cool how you mentioned this about the stories this is actually something that i have heard a lot about buddhism is like releasing all of these stories yep. and it's interesting because the more that i study about the nervous system and how this applies to art therapy i learn basically the same thing like you need to release the story um, basically, you know, people like I can encourage people to share their story, but little by little and like making sure that, that they're not getting too activated, yeah. you know, um, and just sort of like, like doing that in a way that lets the story leave. Right. <laughs> but not not holding on to that story, you know, because that story really does. It has a big, big like it, it's it's like baggage, you know. <laughs> yeah, it has a lot of energetic like it's magnetic, our, the mythology of our yeah. self, right? Like my adventure, my journey, it's, it's so much fun to talk about. That's a lot of the way we bond with other people. Like how does my mythology interact with yours? And then mm -hmm. commingle in a way, but eventually we need to kind of see it for what it is, which is these are stories that arise and pass away. And if we want to return to this, to this baseline, we don't have to throw out the story entirely, but we just have to disidentify with it and see that it actually, I don't want to say it has nothing to do with us, but your brain will come up with the story. Your body comes up with sensations. Your job is to just witness them. Like, wow, what a show. Exactly. Because, I mean, your brain story can change on the flip of a coin. Like, like your brain story. And the thing is, is that when you mentally remember something, you remember the last time that you remembered it. So every single time that you remember it or go back into that memory, you're remembering actually less of what actually happened. So now you have even more like space for your brain to invent things, you know? And so it's just, it's this loop that we get in. Whereas in reality, like what you're sharing with meditation and what you're sharing with the unconditioned state, it's really, that's how you heal from a nervous system perspective is like, you just let it be, you let it pass through your body, you find a way to release it. 
and that's it. I, I, <laughs> I love what you said. Like, yeah, you're you're introducing a lot of chaos in the system because every time you re-remember, it's less in focus. Yeah. It's a much more coarse remembering, and then it just keeps looping and looping until it's like barely similar. This is such a tangential analogy, but I was at this debate about AI, and this one guy was very very fiery about the fact that we'll never get AI to train itself for precisely this reason, because the more, because AI, every time it, let's say, generates a text to then train a subsequent AI on, it'll introduce a few errors. And then those errors will get baked into the new, to the new AI's model. And then those errors will just keep looping and becoming more and more intense until the texts are just incoherent. Similar to what you're saying, which is that you have your initial memory impression. It's very vivid. But then each time you subsequently remember it, it becomes more and more chaotic, less and yeah. less related to the original impression that caused it, right? Yeah, and the thing is, is well, I mean, like, one thing that I just want to say is, like, thank God that AI can't train itself. Like, well, that yeah, actually gives me a sense of peace. Like, I didn't know that, so. Well, I, it was a debate. <laughs> this guy won the debate somehow, but, okay. but anywho. <laughs> Well, okay, in any case, I hope that's the case because it makes me feel a bit like, okay, maybe those cartoons about robots taking over the world might not happen. Um, not that I believe it will happen, but who knows, you know, like, I don't know. But um, yeah, so, but like on a serious note, like what I wanted to respond, oh my gosh, I can't even remember. <laughs> I, I, completely I, I went on this AI tangent, but it just, it, it connected so quickly. He called it like, what is it, like entropic? confusion mm -hmm. like it introduces entry mm -hmm. to the system but no you were saying thank goodness each time you remember something it's not as vivid as the first time yeah yeah and exactly yeah yeah okay this is what i wanted to say so like when you remember things and there is more of that space for imagination <laughs> which isn't always yeah. good um basically what's happening is that your body is responding to your thoughts you know so your body's responding to those memories and those images and so it's generating the feelings that you probably felt when that thing happened and the the difference is here is like you're you don't actually remember all the details of what happened and so if you've lived something that can stay in your, your body and you might not actually know what even happened you know, because your body just is made, it's made to respond, it's made to defend you. So yep. there could have been like, small moments where, you know, your body jumped into this like, hyper defense mode, or maybe it went into the freeze mode or something, but you didn't actually consciously notice that. And so that's why I think that these kinds of practices are really important. Because your mind actually doesn't have all of the information about you, you know? Yeah, no, no, exactly. But what you were saying earlier about sort of your mental state matters and you can cause yourself physical pain with yeah. thoughts. There's an amazing study from my favorite podcast, Andrew Huberman. I think I may have mentioned him to you before, but it was about these rats. And this, what I'm about to say is all in support of the Buddhist maxim, which is mind is the forerunner of all things, essentially. So this one rat was able to run on a treadmill whenever it wanted to. So if it felt like running or not a treadmill, like a, a rat wheel, so it would run whenever it wanted to, but there was another rat who was forced to run whenever the first rat was running. So one rat wanted to, like he had the intention, I want to go run, but mm -hmm. then the other rat was forced to when it didn't want to. <laughs> one rat was getting all of the positive effects from exercise, like willpower, mm -hmm. discipline. The other rat was getting all of the negative effects from stress. They're doing the exact same thing. They're running at the exact same time, at the exact same rate, one of them is choosing to do it. One of them is being forced to do it, right? So just another point that, yeah, the mind, the mind can cause so much damage if we it approach certain situations with the wrong mindset. Although that would suck to be that rat being forced to run. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. For sure. But I mean, that brings up a really good point, you know, is like we can't, like the mind loves to compare because that's the way that we can kind of, um, that's the way that we can conceptualize the world that we live in, you know, like that sense of comparison, that sense of dichotomy that we talked about before, that sense of polarity and opposites gives mm -hmm. us this kind of platform to understand, okay, you must be you because you're not me, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> or like that's, that's white because it's not black, you know, things like that. And so our minds tend to actually go into this state of black and white thinking. It's a survival mode for us. 
um, it helps us to protect ourselves because we can see things as like, oh, you're not part of my tribe. I either must have to run or I have to find a way to kill your yeah, tribe, yeah. you know? And yeah. so this is our ancestral wiring, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. No, exactly. And I think at least language works in this black and white way. At least English yeah. works a lot like Very this. Much. So yeah, of course, think linguistically and conceptually, we're forced to kind of think within polarity, which makes it yeah. extra to talk about anything that goes beyond dichotomy, such as un anything that's unconditioned, right? Right. And since we don't really have words for those things, like, for example, there are some languages that are very fluid in the creation of words. Um, so, for example, you know, German is considered a language of philosophy because you can literally just invent words in German all the time. And so many great German writers, scientists, philosophers, etc., have just, you know, created words on the fly mm -hmm. because most of the words are just compound words. So you can just keep putting words and words and words together. Um, and English doesn't really give you that advantage, you know, so it's sort of like, yeah, language itself sort of gives you this condition through which you can't really, like, move out of it, you know, and I think sometimes it's important to recognize that as well, because so often, I mean, this is why I recommend for everyone to learn at least a second language, you know, I come from the US and... <laughs> People, people are like, whatever about that. Um, but honestly, like learning other languages completely changed my life in the sense of my mental fluidity and flexibility in terms of like, understanding concepts, thinking in new ways, but also not feeling identified to the concepts. Yeah. Because also like when you're not, not speaking your native language all the time, that identity and those experiences that you have speaking that language also kind of <laughs> begin to fade. Yeah. It's fine. I was just speaking French to my grandma and I have this like, not a personality, but yeah, there's different concepts yeah. and different ways I perceive myself in French. But on your language point, I had this very good friend in Hong Kong when I was living there. He did like an, a master's in, um, in Sanskrit language and wow. Indian philosophy at Oxford, like amazing guy. And he would always tell me the nuances of that language, right? Because when I was studying Buddhism, it's a lot of Sanskrit yeah. and Pali. And he would explain that the way the words are constructed, it means like five things in one. And it's English is impoverished in that sense. Because for instance, yeah. life is suffering is kind of the maxim, one of the many truths and maxims of Buddhism. But in Sanskrit, it's life is dukkha. And, a, and every text you'll ever read will say, dukkha is often translated as suffering, but it means oh so much more than just suffering in the normal sense, right? And, and yeah. most actually the word for mindfulness in sanskrit is sati or in pali it's sati but there's actually a scholarly um debate right now on what that word actually means some people think the word means kind of bare awareness of the present moment but other people say it means and it, the word actually does mean both of these things means memory and recollection and those are decently different concepts right is mindfulness, uh, something to do with the memory faculty or is it to do with undifferentiated awareness of the present moment. And the word has both of those connotations in Sanskrit. And so it's very troublesome to bring it to English. Okay, what what do we mean? And both sides of the argument, I think they make very valid points. But it's interesting that in English, we just receive the word mindfulness and we think it has a very set definition. But mm -hmm. if we go back to who wrote the text, they say otherwise. I, I love that so much because like, you know, sometimes we hold on to things so much just based on, you know, how we can define it. And that's, it's just so limiting, you know, like, like through, through my personal experience in learning other languages, I've learned that, yeah, there are languages where you can say the same thing with 10 different words or one word has 10 different meanings and you have to like learn the context. And so you can't, you can't stay so, you know, hard pressed on a concept and you can't stay so hard pressed about being right. You know, I think a lot of times in these spaces or like in philosophical spaces, scientific spaces, it's like, who's right? Who wins the debate? And it's like, well, maybe no one wins. Like, maybe there is no conclusion to this, you know? No, no, exactly. For, I think for certain questions, there can be conclusions. Mm -hmm. Like if you form the scientific question right. in a way and you ask nature politely, nature will give you an answer. Yeah. But for a lot of, I think, existential questions, particularly, yeah, there's no good answer to them. There's this other quote about language that I love so much, and I want to recall its exact phrasing because it's it's like language doesn't 
define reality, but it defines what counts as reality for you. So it's not like the way you think about the world actually changes what's out there physically, but it definitely changes what you consider to count as what's out there for you. It just, as you're saying, all these different concepts, like yeah. you have different concepts than I do if you speak a different language. Yeah, completely. And it's really beautiful to speak with people who have different native languages and see their perspective on the world and how that language has informed their perspective. You know, it's like, it, it, I don't know. There's That's actually, okay, you just made me think of something as well. Something that I always say to people is that I see color as a language in the sense of like, it's a medium through which you can express yourself. And it's a medium through which you can express certain feelings and certain experiences that words can't really touch. You yeah. know? And since, we, you know, we can go back and forth about what colors mean and like there are all these like cultural significances and things like that. There's a felt sense that it's like I can I can feel it, I can show it to you and then you'll perceive it in a different way. And so it's a language that sort of like connects us through feeling rather than through like, this is my concept. Do you agree on my concept? <laughs> like, like, can we agree? Because I mean, in the end, language is also kind of like their agreements, their codes, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, like, like language is an agreement. If we're speaking yeah. both, you know, good, good English speakers, we've agreed that this sentence means this, you say this when someone is in the room, right? We've agreed to certain conventions that probably don't exist in other languages. Like as a Canadian, have moved around the world quite a bit, I found that one of the agreements Canadians make is to be very polite, to say sorry a lot, to yeah. say a lot. <laughs> Lots of people make fun of me here in, in the US, but like there was this one time in a locker room where I was like apologizing profusely to someone and I just like moved by him. It just shit like normal. I moved by someone. I'm like, excuse me, sorry, sorry. And then someone else is like, I don't think you're really sorry enough. And then we had like a funny conversation after that. But that's the one of the best agreements Canadians make, which is be hyper polite. Yeah, no, I actually I learned that because um one of so when I moved to England like years ago, one of the first people I met was a Canadian girl. And so I grew up like only one and a half hours from the border with Canada. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I realized that actually we also had this secret agreement of like, I think she bumped into me and I said, sorry. And then she said, sorry. And we were just like, wait, what? <laughs> here. What about where you are now? What are some like linguistic things you've noticed about the folks? Wow. Okay. I think that's a whole world. There are a lot of different things to say. Um, so most people where I live don't actually speak Spanish as their first language. Okay. Um, maybe some of the kids kids now do or like younger generations are like but they grew up here in Quechua at least and so something that I've learned is that um so Quechua doesn't really have like concepts this is this is what someone told me so I don't know I can't speak for the whole language because there are different dialects as well but someone told me this that like <laughs> this was really interesting to me because this like really like shatters like um, a lot of concepts that we have like in Western languages, romance languages, things like that. Um, so basically what he was describing to me was that in Quechua, like the words that they have are based off of things that you see. And so if I want to say like, I love my partner, I would say like, I love my pigeon because like pigeons go together, you know? Oh, um, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. And so it's, it's really interesting because like I, I asked this person like, you know, are there any words for love is there a word for like cosmos the universe and he was like no how, like, we don't have those, refer, those words how do they refer to like how do they refer to things they, they can't see for like a number like do they like, how do they count well I, I think they do i think they have numbers i don't know i mean i i don't know the ins and outs and this is just like okay. one thing that one person told me so i can't like i can't say that this is actually true or false um but I mean, like from this person's perspective was just like we go I, like for numbers, for example, you can see numbers because you can see like groups of things, yeah, exactly. you know, so I think I think that's sort of where that would come from. Um, but I just think it's interesting because every one thing that I have found universally, because I've asked a lot of people about this is, you know, how do you feel when you speak Quechua? And they say, I feel connected to nature. That I can't even fathom what how do you say that in response to speaking a language that's really cool yeah i mean and it's very interesting because like the words are 
based off of everything that you see in the mountains you know mm. um so yeah there's there's something incredibly special about that that i think and and what people have also described to me is that you know spanish is like the colonizer language of this country you know so of course there's a lot of violence associated with that but also like in the concept conceptual framework people are just like we just don't think that way you know like we don't think about like like if we were going to talk about the universe in quechua we wouldn't need to create a concept for it you know like it's sort of like let's talk about those things based off of what we can already see <laughs> and feel and experience yeah 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 that's great wow yeah it's very grounding yeah i mean i want to learn more about this because i find it to be really fascinating like and you can see it you can see it in the people you can see it in like this very deep sense of just like connection with nature connection with their environment awareness of their environment you know and, and this kind of circles back to something we said earlier where by doing that by grounding things so readily in the present what they can see in their senses that's kind of bringing the unconditioned into the conditioned realm type of thing Ooh, yeah no longer have any kind of dichotomies anymore where it's abstract like theory versus practice like the gap is totally like totally squashed like it's all just like mm -hmm. here now these are these are the things we talk about and we don't need to create like concepts on concepts on concepts to talk about something when it's all kind of just right here right now right i i love that because it's like we don't need to we don't need to think about them as separate like even though we can kind of understand them more deeply through observing this dichotomy, like the more that we observe both of those sides, we come into this sense of cohesion and like this sense of, oh, they're kind of one and the same. <laughs> they're just yeah. different, you know? It's like, no, it's like, I think a lot about mathematics, right? Because math and the symbols of math very, mm -hmm. looks very human constructed, not very natural, but it's through abstracting from all the patterns we've seen right. in nature that we right. then have general formulas that actually integrate all phenomena that we see so it's like we take the first step we categorize we dissect then we create all these abstract framings and then everything turns out to have been integrated the whole time and then we can just loop back to the beginning like in an existential sense and be like oh, okay i've proven to myself through the intellect that everything's connected now mm -hmm. i can rest in the present or at least that's kind of that was my journey now that i've verbalized it i'm like oh yeah I wanted to prove to my own mind that, okay, everything's connected. And then you can come back and experience that for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And it reminds me of something that you said, um, in the beginning of this call, you said something about, oh my gosh, what was it? It was, um, yeah, it was about understanding versus experiencing. Mm. I think this is like a very solid point because, um, you know, like, we can, we can read all of the things we can read all of the different philosophies as you said a lot of them are literally translated into english so a lot of things also do get lost in translation uh -huh. uh, and, and we can think that we understand things but like i i just so i'm curious you know like how do you help people to like go into this experience like how do you help people to experience meditation or experience being present and kind of like learn these concepts concepts or these teachings through the experience rather than necessarily teaching them I, the concept i hope this question right, makes, makes sense total sense and in early buddhism at least there's this kind of threefold pedagogy it's sutta maya panya chinta maya panya bhavana maya panya which is sort of book learning recitation mm -hmm. rationalization and then experiential bhavana right you're experiencing it and i think about this a lot because early on i was like oh I don't want to cheapen this, like the way that meditation is being propagated these days. I don't know how I feel about it, but then I've come to see that, okay, it's actually okay to scale back the experiential side as long as everything is ramping up towards it in the end. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, so to answer the question more directly, certain texts that speak to you, certain accessible meditation practices, certain accessible reflections, Re a reflection in my mind being different from a meditation in the fact that in one hand you're actively engaging in mentation and conceptualization like you're reflecting you're thinking and on the other hand you're more trying to view concepts and not actually perpetuate the thinking process mm -hmm. right? right and so, so 
Oh yeah, sorry, was... Juan. No, 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 no. Continue. I just have endless questions. Oh, and I, I can talk endlessly also. But like, so one, one set of reflections that is often done to, it's a little spooky. To encourage you to meditate would be reflections on, on death and reflections on repulsiveness. So in on one sense, if you're not inspired to meditate right now and engage in the effort of, let's say, doing a simple breath meditation. The, the technique would be you place your awareness below your nostrils, above your upper lip. You focus on the sensation of breathing. Whenever the mind wanders away, you bring it back. If that's too much for you right now, some of the texts suggest, okay, really think about how you're going to die in the sense that visualize the graveyard, visualize bones scattered on the ground, visualize bloody limbs. And the texts, I mean, this is like sort of the gold standard of meditative practice, the Maha Satipatthana Sutta, it starts with these repulsiveness, charnel ground visualizations, where you say, one day I'll be in a charnel ground. And they actually suggest you go there. Like this is purely yeah. visualization. You go to the charnel <laughs> You see that as inspiration to then say, okay, I'm going to die. My body is conditioned. I'm impermanent. Better realize the unconditioned now because my time is limited. Yeah. I I'm just I'm just getting so excited because um so there's this song it's called Pop Song by this band called Starfucker. I do recommend that you listen to it. I know it sounds strange. Um but if you look at the lyrics, so hmm. I I started listening to this band I think when I was in like ninth grade or something. Okay. And one day I was like, what do these lyrics mean? You know? So I so I looked up what the lyrics were and like the main chorus is like your body is a corpse. A rusty bag of nails lying by the sea. Um, your skin is slipping off. The seaweeds and the seaweed and urchins feed on your bones. And so I read that. I was like, "All right." Um, <laughs> someone, someone left a comment. They were like, "Oh, this is a Buddhist meditation. Like, it's a Buddhist meditation oh, on really? death." Like, oh, cool. Yeah, and I mean, I actually so I made a cover of this song because I love this song very much because I think it's like this very um upbeat way to connect with death like from this space of like i don't know like from, from this almost celebratory space because when i had read this about the lyrics i was listening to it one time on a trip like just in the bus and i just imagined my body like that and i really felt this sense of freedom i was like i'm just gonna allow myself to you know to be dead and a lot of things opened up for me from that point forward so I just, I think it's just really cool that you mentioned that specifically because, yeah, that's been a really pivotal part for me. Um, and just, I love the fact that like people have taken this into songs, into lyrics, into things that like, into places where you wouldn't expect these kinds of teachings to be. I mean, you know? I wasn't expecting you to say it's a Buddhist meditation song, so to speak, because a lot of people. Well, it might, that it might not actually be a Buddhist oh, okay. meditation. Is like this was someone's time? interpretation of the lyrics like they read the lyrics oh. they were like oh that's a buddhist meditation on death um but i actually like i sent the cover that i made to the band and they said that it's a song from the grim reaper's perspective so oh that's so funny you sent it to the band that's hardcore nice yeah i was like i just was so stoked i was like oh my gosh i just because i i slowed the song down and i made it because like if you don't actually listen to the lyrics it sounds kind of like soft kind of like romantic you know um, but if you actually listen to the lyrics, you're like, wait, what? And so, sorry, what? Oh, no, I'm just saying, if you listen to the lyrics, it's hardcore. Yeah, it's intense. And, it, and it's cool. Like, I really like this kind of, um, I like this mixture, you know, of like having something that's very profound in a song where you wouldn't expect it. Because I think there's like that communication of, wow, okay, I don't only have to see this in this way, you know, like we've been taught to see death in a very particular way, but we can see it in other ways. You yeah. Know? But what's interesting, you said it helped you open up a lot of the death reflections aren't necessarily there to let you have the spiritual experience then and there, although that can happen. They're, they're also kind of meant to scare you and to make you remember, hey, my time is hyper limited here. I should get to the real practice. Yeah. I mean, in one of the I'm in they frame those death reflections as strictly being there as a preliminary teaching to the later meditations. Like start here if you're not inspired enough. But it's cool that also clearly those teachings can, they can do a lot on their own. It's like memento mori, like always have death on your mind. 
Right. Yeah. And I think Alan Watts talks about this a lot as well. I used to listen to him a lot at that time. And yeah, he talked about death a lot as sort of like this, um, like this reference point mm -hmm. to like something, something to call back on, like you said, with that quote, I think he also mentioned that quote Probably. Um, of just like, you know, using death as a reason to live more fully, you know, and I mean, I definitely have felt that fear before of like, not the fear of death, but the fear of not living properly, you know, sure. that I think death evokes in that sense of, okay, I've connected with death. I've seen my body by the sea, <laughs> eaten by urchins. <laughs> but it's like, okay, what am I going to do now? And so it's true, like for several years afterwards, um, I definitely felt a sense of pressure in terms of like, okay, what am I going to do with, with my life? And so this is actually where I recommend to people like, maybe move away <laughs> from Western teachings about finding your life purpose and all of those types of things. Because I think that, um, I think that like the, I, I, I don't, I can't say the Buddhist path, but I would say like the path of meditation of connecting with yourself, of connecting with your body, connecting with nature, isn't one of having a particular purpose. You know, I think, I think it's very, it's, it's unconditioned, like, like what we've been talking about. It doesn't really, like, I think a lot of people will feel pressure to, you know, create a career or create something that is of purpose. And I think that's beautiful. And of course, I'm part of that, <laughs> in a way. Um, but like, I, I don't think we can define our purpose off of that. And I don't think we need to have a purpose, you know, I, I think just like living is enough, you know, embracing the feeling of being alive. Oh, totally. And, and also, I think that if we had a purpose, I doubt we would be able to articulate it and conceptualize it perfectly. Yeah. As yes. <laughs> like, like from the way I understand it, it's like have aims, aim somewhere yeah. high, but then naturally as you move towards that aim, your vision will change and you'll be like, oh, actually I meant to aim there. And you keep iterating on that. But the whole time that's just your mind, your body is going where it's going anyway. It's just about what kind of conceptual framing do you have about your adventure? through this plane and how much resistance are you putting up to sorry this just reminded me of this this great uh, like there's the the buddhist discourses are called suttas mm -hmm. and i love this uh, it's the first sutta of the samyutta nikaya which i think i mentioned earlier which is one of the collections of discourses in buddhism and it has to do with what we were saying someone asked the buddha how did you cross the flood the flood here being a metaphor for you know everything that causes you to suffer mm -hmm. and he said mm -hmm. by not not straining and by not stopping. That's how I cross the flood. So basically, not stopping means you just you just keep going. You keep mm -hmm. flowing because your body keeps going. Whether or not you want to keep going, you're aging, you're decaying, your body's continually going. And so you don't stop. You don't offer resistance to that. And you don't offer resistance to anything. And then it's all okay. Like as long as you understand that it's, good, it's happening anyway. Like whether you let go or not, you have to let go. And especially when you die you're gonna have to let go anyways eventually yes and that, that's the liberation that i found like when i said you know like this like connecting with death opened things up for me um you know i mean i was in high school i was like i think yeah i was 15 or something mm -hmm. and so i was at this time where everyone's putting all of these ideals yeah. or like frameworks of oh you should do this you should live like that you have to work in this thing you have to make this much money you have to do that and this and like all of these conditions, right? Um, and so like connecting with death opened something up for me because I was like, actually, I'm so much more than anything that I could ever do or anything that I could ever explain, you know? And I think that that made me feel like, you know, it made me feel a lot less pressure. I think a lot of people, you know, if you're here, if you've gotten into spirituality, meditation, things like that, you've probably felt the stress. You've probably felt the pressure. You've probably had you know, some kind of rupture in your personal life that led you to like, okay, there is something more, <laughs> like there is something deeper, you know? And so I think that connecting on this level gives you that sense. And, and this is what we talked about before this call was like, the unconditioned state is about not needing conditions in order to live right now, you yeah. know, to be in the present moment, to feel alive, to feel that sense of, of, of peace, of groundedness, of joy in life, you know, rather than having always these conditions for these things. I think a lot of us have, at least <laughs> like my experience growing up in the US, there are endless conditions 
for literally anything you want in life you know it could be so incredibly simple you know like oh i just i want like a lot of people say i want to feel inner peace you know like what do you think about that for example there's this quote that probably is counter a lot of the new age stuff from Sri Nisigar Dr. Maharaj, which is, if you want peace, deserve it. Which everyone's like, what? Of course I deserve peace. It's like, do you deserve peace? Do you train your mind? Do you sit down and feel how you're feeling? Yeah. Like, peace is available to us at all times. I believe that. Mm -hmm. Like, peace is the current for sure. But are you doing any behaviors to help that shine forth? Like, similar to that wind quote, like, the wind is everywhere. But are you fanning to get the breeze on you? Yeah. Probably not. not. And the, 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 there's this famous Buddhist, Shanti Deva. He wrote this amazing, you know, manual on becoming a bodhisattva. And it was that we hate suffering, but love its causes. It's, right. It's like we planting seeds that are bitter. And then when they grow up to be bitter trees, we're like, oh, a bitter tree. No, I wanted a sweet tree. And it's like, well, you planted the bitter fruit. And I do that all the time. We all do that. Well, right? I but we need. Yeah. I mean, I think that's like the essence of Western culture, though, is like, you know, we we do so many things to avoid suffering that we actually create more suffering than we would have, like, yep. experienced in the first place. No, no, no. no exactly. Exactly. No, I'm amazing. <laughs> we, we've covered some solid ground. We really, really have. I, like, I'm just laughing so much because there's like, there's just so much to say. And I think you know, I guess my invitation for everyone is, is to become aware of the conditions that you have, you know, like, do you feel like, do you feel like you deserve to feel at peace in this moment? Like, do you feel like you deserve to feel fine, you know, without any, like, mental occupation, like preoccupations or things like that, you know, like, do you feel like you are worthy of that? Like, like do you feel like you deserve that at, at this moment, you know, because I think a lot of times, like, I, I guess, like, I I'm, I'm referring a lot to Western culture because it's like, it's obviously what I, I grew up with. And I think it's very difficult to deprogram in a way because it's like you learn from an early age that in order to even receive love, you have to prove yourself in a certain way. Mm. You have to do certain things, you know, whereas like what you're saying about the wind, the wind is everywhere. You just have to kind of like channel yeah. it to yourself, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, like, we don't see love that way, you know, in Western culture. We see it as something transactional. We see it as something like, if I do this, I receive this, you know. And so I guess I would just invite everyone here, like, if you want to tap into this state, from what I've understood from what we've talked about so far, please, like, correct me if not. Um, it's just to kind of observe what your conditions are, you know. Like, if if you actually feel, you know, do you feel like I have to do this and this and that in order to... I don't know, do that thing that you love or, you know, do something that genuinely brings you joy or a sense of peace and harmony, you know, like, I think, I think maybe yeah. that's a good start for people to, yeah, sure. <laughs> to observe. And you don't throw them, like, we live in conditionality, right? Like, yeah. if I want to and have a good day, I need to pack my bag now. And there's certain conditioned things right. that need to happen. But I think it's about not being bound by conditionality yeah. and really find well, the source of it is unconditionality. There's this place within me where peace radiates outwards. Like, it's not something I can get out there. Mm -hmm. Like, one of the, I did a master's in Buddhist studies, and the tagline of the program, which is kind of hilarious, is sustainable happiness. And, and the point of that is that, Ooh, I love that. Happiness in the world, it's not sustainable because everything is conditioned. Yeah. And because everything is conditioned, it means everything's impermanent which means that if you're staking all your happiness on that which is by nature impermanent, well then, well, uh-oh, it's gonna go away. And so then you've, you've staked a claim in the sand and the sand's gonna disintegrate. And so the whole point of the course and of teachings is that there's a place where you can find sustainable happiness, right? Happiness yeah. isn't conditioned by something that just is inherent, right? Yeah, I, I love what you're saying there because like, it just goes back to that point of like feeling like we have to like everything is connected to some kind of condition you know whereas like these inner states these feelings like you can generate them within yourself you're meant to and what we talked about before like your thoughts do create emotions in your body so like you do have the power to focus your thoughts in different ways to generate different feelings in your body you know i'm not 
like saying to only think positively because I don't think that that's yeah. I don't think that's healthy. Um, but I, I would say, you know, become aware of those negative, dense feelings, difficult thoughts and refocus that energy, you know, like refocus those thoughts in a way that you don't necessarily have to feel good, but just to feel present, just to feel stable, you know, just feel bad, like just because you're feeling physically bad. The Buddhist insight is that it's not you that's feeling bad. There's just feeling bad. Like, yeah, I love that. who's raining the rain? Like, that doesn't make sense. It's just raining. Like, oh, I'm feeling a pain in my leg. No, there's just pain in your leg. There's just pain in leg. Or, and if you break it down even further, there's just pain. And if you break it down even further, there's just sensation. Mm -hmm. And it's like di mm -hmm. dissect, dissect. At least this is the sort of path of analysis, yeah. right? There's yeah. at least one path, Vipassana. It's a path of analytical dissection of body and mind, seeing that everything is impermanent. But there's tons of other paths, right? You know, mm -hmm. in yoga, bhakti yoga, devotional yoga, that's a whole different path that I think we were saying on our last call, many paths up the mountain, the devotional path leads to the same place. Or there's also karma yoga, the path of selfless action, that also leads to the same place, right? Many, all the other traditions we haven't mentioned. Yeah, there are endless ways, you know, um, and I just wanted to point out, so someone, uh, Georgia left a comment that says, everyone wants unconditional love, but most people only give conditional love. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, because this is going to sound so trite, but yeah, we start giving unconditional love to ourselves first and unlocking that within us. And then only then we, we can sort of really give it to others. And again, it sounds so, so trite because everyone just repeats this. It's unfortunate because it's true, which is that, yeah, once you start giving that, you'll be, you'll find other people that start giving that to you, right? People it's very true. stuck in conditionality anymore. Yeah, and you know, what I've observed over time is just being in nature, going to the forest, going to the lake, things like that really helped me to connect with the sense of unconditionality, connecting with breath, you know, like connecting with the fact that the air is here and we're all sharing it, you know, like, like the mind is always so, so, um, so focused on creating comparisons and separations between us, but like, we're all breathing the same air. We're all on this planet right now. We're sharing this, like, we're all a part of this living, breathing planet, you know, and we're living and breathing as this planet is also living and breathing, you know? So I think there's something very beautiful in that is that the air is unconditional. Like when you plant a fruit tree, for example, it gives unconditionally to mm -hmm. you. Um, yeah, I've learned a lot of this, like from fruit trees, <laughs> particularly because you plant the seed, the the tree grows in a couple of years and then when it gives it gives like <laughs> when i was a kid we had a few um apple trees and every year we would have so many apples that it would just be like okay who can we give these apples to <laughs> we need to find people to give these apples to and i just i feel like that's such a beautiful um example of unconditional love is that it really is overflowing if you just connect to the essence of what it actually is, you know, and connect to the fact that it doesn't, like love doesn't look one way, you know, I think sometimes we think that love has to be a certain way. But mm. if you can begin to see love in these things like apple trees or birds or things like that, then you begin to see love everywhere, you know? Yep. And yeah, no, lots of thoughts on what you just said. A lot about love, like what is love and this yeah. idea of condition yeah. too, and may, love isn't always like sappy and gooey, exactly. right? Please. In Buddhism, <laughs> distinction between like idiot, I mean, idiot compassion, which is just like, oh, no, no, like just coddling and then like fear, passion, compassion that's there to wake you up. Like, do I say something to you because it'll pacify you in the moment? Or do I say something to you that might rile you up, but in the long run is actually for the best they will actually liberate you from suffering more sustainably than if i just pacified you in the moment right so unconditional love can look like this too in buddhism there's this concept of upaya skillful means which is exactly this which is that you don't just say what might appear conventionally as love or compassion you say what really needs to be said for the betterment of that person 
that's really beautiful i i just <laughs> like as we were talking about like the polite culture and like oh i'm sorry and things like that i think that's such an important message to remember is like sometimes you don't need to be nice all the time you know like you don't need to be rude or or brash you know but like i i've I've noticed that in relationships like the things that are that feel like the most difficult to say are the ones that liberate everything you know of course no absolutely and no and yeah but then i think the discernment comes in because you can't then let your ego take over and just of course your feeling like there's a difference between just saying whatever comes to mind yeah. versus <laughs> with respect to liberating like what do they really need to hear right now versus what do i really want to tell them in like a spiteful revengeful way right so it's there's a very there's a very it's about fine, the intention yeah simply put yeah i'm just talking in paragraphs you're like intention i'm like yes it is that <laughs> because yeah sometimes we just say things and it's like it's very automatic you know but like when you think about okay what's my intention with saying this to this person it really i think it helps just kind of like bring things to oh you know what i it like it doesn't have have to be this dramatic thing you know i think our minds over dramatize some things and and i i do i completely agree with you of like love sometimes is is painful it's sometimes uncomfortable you know sometimes we have to say things that don't feel good but like if the intention is pure then i think that the intention will be transmitted even if the other person isn't like fully aware of that yeah. you know my uh amazing dad is in the chat and wrote this lovely paragraph here to belong is a state of being to love is a condition what you're looking for when you talk about unconditional surrender is actually belonging to and for others yeah to be belong state of love, love is a condition yeah i mean I, yeah i wonder because to love i'm I gonna guess, save this i'm gonna take a screenshot <laughs> go to his website he has many more writings like this but yeah Therefore, to my mind, there is no unconditional love, unconditional belonging. Yeah, I, I like because mm. like, yeah, at least the word love in English it kind of represents a like a duality. There's love and other love as well. Like there's there's two people involved. Versus yeah. Belonging seems more integrative. Yeah. In, in the same way that a lot of people talk about sustainability, but then I've heard that the word kinship is actually much better because that makes it sound like. Well, we're also brothers and sisters with the trees, exactly. with the animals, mm -hmm. with the plants, versus like sustainability, like sustainability and stewardship have this kind of hierarchy built into it. Versus kinship is more belonging. Like we unconditionally mm -hmm. belong with all of nature, with everything here. So we should take care of it from that perspective, not out of some beautiful "I'm the steward of nature, I know better," but yeah. just brother, the tree, the maple tree over there. Of course, I want to make sure no one harms it. In the mornings, I do this with uh, the beautiful cockroaches in my that are in my in the morning. Like every day, they'll like do something silly and like fall in a dish I didn't clean. Right. So like they'll drowning, and I'm like, I have to save you again. Like you are my brother. I have to remind myself constantly. <laughs> like yeah, you're a little gross, but like okay, <laughs> just get up. There. Very good practice. I love that <laughs> meditative <laughs> practice for for every day. <laughs> I mean, I feel like that's a marker. Like it is. It in, definitely is. Of course, I taught last year. One of the kind of I made this learner profile. Like, who do you become after you've done it? And of course, I didn't make everything up on the spot. But one of is one of them is the sense of kinship. Like, you shouldn't not kill bugs because someone said don't kill bugs. For instance, you don't right. kill bugs because you can't kill bugs. Like, how could you do that? Like, that's that's your brother. That's your sister on the ground there that looks a little looks a little squiggly has eight legs but like you can't even imagine doing it yeah. versus yeah. But the difference of virtue where it's like you start you start being just a rule follower and then eventually it's automatic to follow the rules oh yeah that's it. love declared is the end of it i mean of course yeah. i mean it's the alan watts quote where these two zen masters this one zen master was walking this path every morning for a few hours and then you come back. And then one day his student's like, oh, can I join you? And the guy was like, fine. And then afterwards, the guy said, you can never join me again because you spoke. And then on the and while they were walking, what the guy said was like, wow, what a beautiful walk. And then the master was like, yeah, but it's a shame to say so. Banned from 
further walks. <laughs> Love declared is the end of it. Beauty, like, of course, when you, all the best things are unsayable. Yeah. I thought who said this. And then second best are the things we can say with poetry. Third best are the things we can say with, like, rational language type of thing. So what we talk about mm -hmm. is, like, third tier stuff. Yeah, exactly. Like, like these conversations really are, <laughs> they're the beginning, you know, like, like hopefully they kind of open up things in our minds and things like that. And then from there, you can more deeply experience that. But, but yeah, I, I think, you know, words are, that's why I connect so deeply with colors. Like I said before, it's like words are just very limiting, you know? <laughs> colors are like, they're older, like ancient humans yeah. didn't have Sanskrit or German but they definitely saw colors. Yeah. They had to, or they were selected out of the gene pool. Right, yeah. And and it's actually very interesting, like how we were talking about nature, being a part of nature. We've adapted to have a very specific relationship with the color green. Mm. Um, so when we were nomadic, you know, when we were moving around, the color green meant life, it meant water, it meant food, you know? And so actually the color green has been shown to calm our nervous systems and to spark creativity, to spark sense of resourcefulness. So it's very interesting, you know, like our relationship with color is very ancestral, as you said. No, exactly. And we can actually discern, I, I don't know if I'm quoting this perfectly right, but the most shades of green, and that's yes. why night vision are green. Like the reason we have night vision goggles that aren't orange is because our eyes aren't as sensitive to orange as they are to green. Wow, I didn't know that about the night goggles. Oh, thank you so much for everything that you shared here. Bye, Shoki. <laughs> <laughs> I really, really, I love that phrase, unconditional belonging. That is, I'm writing that down. No, somewhere. no, but belonging, it's nice to play, like, as much as words cannot capture things, it's always fun to try to find the right word that points to just the right thing you're trying to get at. Yeah. But it points to yeah. it, isn't it? But some words definitely point better than other words. There's no doubt. Exactly. Okay. Okay. So really quick, I just, I have, well, not really quick. It doesn't have to be quick. I just have a few questions that I'm like almost forgetting <laughs> that I want to ask you. Yeah. Um, so the first question that I wanted to ask you, you know, is like when you teach meditation to people, do you feel like sometimes you need to give them concepts in order to like kind of surrender to the experience more? Yeah. Yeah, of course. I think concepts are, in the same way you said that color kind of quells the mind sometimes you need mm -hmm. concept every now and again and you need a modicum of conceptual understanding to even understand what you're doing because sure concepts might shroud the truth but we le learned ignorance through repetition so we need to unlearn it through repetition and so we need to learn the good concepts to counteract the bad concepts to right. ultimately end all concepts but we need need to start where we are, which is a conceptual level. So as I said earlier, you start with concepts, then you go to rationalizations, and then you go to the experience itself. But there's actually a, a big split in certain meditative um, lineages. So, so Vipassana I've spoken of a lot. It's sort of the type of meditation that the Buddha used to get enlightened, he rediscovered. In current lineages, Burmese lineages specifically, there's a distinction between dry Vipassana and non-dry Vipassana which is, oh, sorry, that's not the, the distinction is rather noting versus not noting, which is that when you experience a sensation in some lineages, they say, note the sensation for what it is. Pain, pain, bliss, bliss, a thought, a thought, and et cetera. Other traditions say, don't do that because then you're mediating your experience mm -hmm. with a con and you're no longer in touch with bare reality. The other lineage would say, this is a great first step though. Yes. Like, at least now you're creating direct experience with just one concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so some, so Mahasi Sayada's Vipassana lineage, they have a lot of noting versus the SM Goenka Vipassana is kind of not anti-concepts, but when you're practicing in the moment, you're not to note or describe or label the sensation in any way. You're just observing it as it is, and then, right? Because eventually you drop off the concept anyway. Right, because like maybe afterwards for example maybe the person would come to some sort of realization right exactly and or one mm -hmm. thing about concepts is when you're first trying to feel the body you might not understand what that even means unless you're given concepts so like feel mm -hmm. the sensations of your head what the hell does that mean 
what is what are sensations on the top of my head but if i give you a list pressure mm -hmm. tingling mm -hmm. eating, maybe it's like ants crawling on your skin maybe it's like needles if i give you metaphors if i give you concepts then maybe eventually you'll be like oh that's what a sensation is because we yeah we throw these words around as if you know their meaning is very clear but for most people i'd imagine one of the main things i emphasize whenever i've taught breath meditation is if i just say focus on your breathing that is i think a pretty bare bones not helpful instruction like, <laughs> what if yeah that makes what is the sense. object like the object of meditation needs to be clear there's no mystery yeah. involved in what it means to focus on the breath and there's all these fine grades like what do i focus on in my tradition it's sort of the touch of the breath which means the the actual sensation of the air in a certain area and then well where do you focus on it do you focus on the in breath the out breath the whole breath if you're counting the breath which is again a conceptual mediation but i think it's a great stage a lot of mornings when i like my mind is too active i'll definitely count breaths mm -hmm. how do you do you count it before it goes in do you count it at the end of the breath do you count it during the breath? Like there's all this nuance. And once you start exploring concepts with this level of nuance, then you understand the limitations of concepts. And then it's more easy to go beyond them eventually. Okay. 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 So what I'm understanding awesome. here is that it depends on the type of meditation as well. And it depends on where the person is at really. More than Disposition anything. and type of meditation. Yeah, of course. The level of concepts is, yeah, it depends where you're at, of course. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is just one small slice of Buddhism. From my degree, mm -hmm. I learned in Buddhisms. There's so many, there's myriad types of Buddhisms out there. Right. The same core, of course, but pract their practices are quite different. I hope that- And so- Question. Yeah, no, no, it totally makes sense. Because, I mean, <laughs> yeah, like there, there are a lot of possibilities to work with, you know? um so like when you do teach meditation to people do you kind of already have a plan of which type of meditation you'll teach them or do you kind of base it off of where the person's at and what technique you think would be most helpful for them i don't oh, consider myself thank you so much oh i love you gilad thank you for being here oh blessing a very good friend of mine we studied philosophy together at university <laughs> Oh, I was so struck by the beauty. I definitely forgot exactly what I was saying. Uh, <laughs> oh, yes. What I was going to say is it coming back? Meditation. Oh, yeah. I, I, I consider myself not very far along the path, but I definitely consider myself having taken a few more steps maybe than the average person. But mm -hmm. given that the steps I've taken have been on a very specific path. So mm -hmm. I don't think I'm qualified to teach myriad types of meditation, okay, right? So essentially what I know, I can only explain what worked for me, which is certain recollection practices, certain virtue trainings, breath meditation, and then the practice of Satipatthana, which is the practice of observing these four categories of existence and understanding that they are impermanent through this kind of analytical dissection that I explained to you earlier, yeah. where you're kind of, for instance, you start by, trying to focus on your hand. And then at first you can't notice your hand at all. It's like a blob. But then you've sharpened your awareness and you're like, oh, okay, I can discern my fingers. And then you discern, well, those are made up of sensations. And then you discern, well, those, those sensations are always kind of arising and passing away. And then you discern, oh, it's actually all impermanent. What I thought was a solid hand, conceptually, is actually, there's nothing solid about it. And then you do this process throughout your entire body, throughout your entire mentality as well like thoughts, like what is my mind when there's no thoughts? Is there a mind without thoughts or is, is there only like when a thought arises, is there a thinker, is there no thinker? Mm -hmm. All these questions mm -hmm. dissolve because all you're doing is you're observing the arising and the passing away. Right. And that's all I can teach someone is how to sharpen the mind through breath meditation, how to enable yourself to have a calm mind through certain virtue trainings, which is just behavioral modifications, precepts you can take, because the Buddhist premise is that you take virtue tra training, which is essentially you abstain from certain activities and you cultivate other positive qualities through like journaling, through mental repetition to calm down your mind. A podcast I just 
or today had a great example. If you've spent the whole day lying and killing people, and then you sit down to practice breath meditation, you're not going to have a good time. You're going to have a mind assaulted by all those yeah. horrible things you've done. If you had a mind, if you had a day where you just did honest things, you told the truth, you helped people, and you sit down to meditate, nothing will come to you. You'll have a clean, calm mind. So the, Ooh, you I love that the perspective. Earth, right? It's so pragmatic. And so the Buddhist yeah. path is three things, virtue, concentration, and wisdom. The virtue part is, yeah, you do these actions, of course, for the betterment of other people, but to calm your own mind so that you're able to practice concentration and serenity. So you focus on your breath and so on. You practice, you walk up the ladder of concentration states. And then with your sharpened awareness, you bring that to the body structure and then you, di you dissolve it, you dissect it. You see that it's all impermanent. And then you go to the mind, you dissolve it, you dissect it. You see that it's all impermanent. And you see that everything is just arising and passing away, not owned by you, just happening. And that's unconditioned, right? Wow. So that's all I can teach, basically. Yeah, and but that's a lot. That, not, yeah. I mean, like, of course, you explained it in a couple of minutes, but like, to really experience that, to embody that is a big process. You know? I mean, it's, a, it's such a beautiful, straightforward path where it's like, and, and the way of Alexander Berzin, I, he's a doctor of Tibetan Buddhism, it just he, he defines it so simply where the first step is you get your act together. Like you just stop doing what you shouldn't do and you start doing what you should do in the physical plane. You get your act together, you focus your mind, and then you investigate your body with that mind. And then that cycle keeps looping, right? Because once you've started to discern things about your own body-mind structure, you can then refine the way you act in the world in accordance with what you've realized. And then the theory goes, then you've refined your actions so your mind will be even calmer. So you can sharpen it even more to then discern even more to then further refine. And then it just keeps looping like this. Wow. This is just, it's, it's such a world. Like everything you're explaining, I just, yeah, it's like taking me on a whole adventure. It's an awesome, I, it's, a, it's a great world. It's the thing yeah. I'm most grateful for encountering in this lifetime. And, and how did you how did you encounter it? Parents that were very open to me doing wild things. I I think I was yeah searching for something in my youth. I had a lot of spiritual books in my house, so I would pick these up, and I was very confused. I was like, well, what are these monks doing? Why would they leave society? Okay. When society is so awesome, and like they can't, can't buy things anymore, they. They can't do, they can't drink. Like, why would they do this? And shave their heads and renounce all possessions and become homeless beggars, <laughs> right? Why would they do that? What could they gain from that? So I was very desperate to figure out that path of life. And so my parents let me at 17 do my first kind of silent 10-day meditation retreat. Wow. And that, yeah, that was the catalyst. You know, a lot of philosophers say that everything is a footnote on Plato. And I do believe that everything in my life is a footnote on that first experience of meditation. Right. Well, right. What, yeah. what about you though? What was your, what, what was a catalyzing moment? For meditation? For, med for just meditation, for turning inwards. Um, wow, okay. So I, I wanna think, yeah, my time, my, my understanding of time is kind of messy sometimes. So I was in, I think I was in, yeah, I, I was in 11th grade, mm. um, so, so I was probably like 15 or something. Um, and I, I was, no, I was 14 the year before that. I was kind of curious about meditation. I think I had looked up a little bit online before I had tried a couple of things, mm. but I never stayed with it. And then when I turned 15, I was like, oh, I'm kind of curious about this. I'd like to make this more of a habit. Um, but <laughs> that year my life was like pure chaos in so many like personal ways. Uh, and I didn't um, didn't create that habit until so <laughs> this is like kind of the most ridiculous story. So, um, yeah, I had my first relationship when I was when I was 16. Yeah. So we went from 15 now to yeah. 16, um, had this relationship. I had a lot of things changing in my personal life with my family and just a lot of things going on. That relationship ended. And so I was like, OK, I've got two choices. <laughs> Because it was a very hard year for me. I was I was struggling with a lot of different things. So it's like, I can either use this breakup as a reason to sink, or I can use it as a reason to swim. You know, like, I've got, I've got two choices. <laughs> I need to pick one. Um, 
So I decided, I was like, well, I don't know what love is. So I was like, why don't I just go to the library you know, to explore what, what love could be? <laughs> so I found, um, I found several different books and a lot of them in nature were spiritual books. I didn't really, I wasn't looking for that particularly. They just kind of ended up talking about different spiritual traditions and like different ways of seeing love different ways of connecting with the heart, you know, seeing love as a verb rather than just like a noun or something that we like exchange with each other. Mm -hmm. And so, so yeah, I, <laughs> I had that day where I went to the library and I was like, yeah, I think I should start meditating. You know, I think like I really need to do this now. Um, so yeah, I would just set up a timer every morning for like 20 minutes and I would just, I, I did like, at the beginning, I did like this purple tornado technique. <laughs> I just imagine a purple tornado in my head, like taking away like all of like the thoughts, all of them, the positive ones, the negative ones, whatever, just like wiping everything out. Nice. <laughs> and that's, that's, yeah, that's sort of how it started. And then it got to a point where I didn't need the purple tor tornado, but I knew that I had it if I, you know, had a lot of thoughts. <laughs> um, and it was it was amazing because like through meditation I I didn't expect anything to happen I came with a very open mind, um, and I had some very beautiful experiences in nature that very much changed um, like my feelings and my perceptions you know, so the first one was that I was meditating in my backyard and we had this um, this big oak tree, and <laughs> and like the wind was blowing and there was one point where I just kind of felt like merged with this tree. Like I felt like I was a leaf blowing in the wind. And and it wasn't like a conscious experience. It was, I think probably the first time that I had this experience of like, my mind wasn't controlling the outcome or the feeling or what was I, what I was experiencing. And so from there I was like, whoa, okay. <laughs> I didn't I didn't know that could happen. And then I think it was like maybe a couple weeks or a couple months later, I, I was going to the forest every day because I live very close to the forest. Um, so. So I sat, I sat on this rock and there was a woodpecker or no, I think there was a chipmunk or something. There was some animal like making a consistent noise. Mm. And at one point I just, I was just like sitting there with my eyes closed and I just kind of merged with this, this noise. And I really felt this sort of feeling of like being, just being com completely connected with the forest, you know, being part of this ecosystem, being held by that, you know, not not feeling the sense of like, oh, I'm in the forest, you know, it was more like I'm part of the forest. <laughs> and and that was that was really beautiful for me as well. And so all of that, that was happening at the same time that I was painting every day and painting was like an active meditation process where I was painting without a goal in mind. So that was a really difficult process because um like when you create something with your own hands right you know like there's sort of like this sense of you're investing your time you're investing your energy your creative energy into it so you kind of like want it to turn out good in some way so I really I had to kind of release that um and I made a lot of things that I really didn't like but that liberated me you know and so painting became this process of like I felt like it really it really was like a meditation process for me. Like I, I got into this state where I didn't know what I painted. <laughs> like I would paint and then I would look at the painting and I was like, who painted that? You know, so I would, yeah, yeah so I would just have like all of these realizations and, and different things. And then I would just, I started like automatic writing as well. Like I wrote a lot of things that I was just like, I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't even know where these thoughts are coming from. And that happened a lot like, like this, um, this combination of like the forest meditating and painting created this space where I just, I felt like I was receiving a lot of energy or like a lot of information, mm. um, but it wasn't like consciously processed information. You know, it's like the information of the forest, the information of colors, um, the information of like the water I'm using in the paint, you know, like all of these different elements, I was realizing how deeply, um, they were changing my mind <laughs> and like I would just I would wake up I remember I had this phase for like several months when I first started meditating and I remember later on I found a meditation group in my hometown because I was like I just kind of want to talk to people about this like are other people experiencing similar things and so I remember I'd wake up every morning 
And I would just like write and write and write and write. And it was just kind of like flowing out of me. I felt like there was so much coming out of me. And I think I was just like realizing a lot of different things. Um, and then when I started meditating with other people, um, there were all, there was like, like a completely different experience in that as well of like feeling that sense of community, feeling that sense of shared intention. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> there's so much, there's so That's much here. Amazing story. There's so much I want to jump in on, but the last thing you said, meditating with other people, it's so beautiful. In, yeah. in the that I've practiced in SM Goenka Vipassana, you do these silent retreats with people and you don't talk the whole time until the last day. And if I just told you, you don't talk to someone for nine days and then you speak with them, you'd be like, oh, they're a stranger, but they're not a stranger. No. You've, you, you've shared a space with them. And it's not in like a hippie sense, of shared energy with them. Like you've observed their mannerisms. You've observed how do they sit? How do they move? How do they breathe? And if you're thinking, oh, well, what do you mean? How do they breathe? But if you're on a silent retreat, everything is, you're, you're, you become highly perceptive and the environment becomes much more alive, right? It's almost like a function of your awareness dictates how alive your environment is mm. right like if, you're, if, if you bring a, a coarse awareness to an environment then yeah you'll be confronted with coarse sensory objects if your awareness is fine and refined then the world is fine and refined and beautiful and you'll find beauty in a flower and in the sun like sometimes when i walk to work i'll just like i work in like downtown financial district and so you can never see the sun except in the morning sometimes and so I'll just, and as I'm walking, if there's a sunspot, I'll just like stand there for a few minutes, yeah. like beaming my eyes. <laughs> Some people walk by, probably like, all right, this is just a, another wild New York person. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, guys, I swear. <laughs> but no, you said, it's, your, your journey was awesome. And one thing that stuck out was this early childhood experience, although you weren't a child, of like a merger with, with an object, yeah. right? So you merged with the sound. Yeah. And a lot of people, seem to have that there's these states in concentration meditation called the jhanas and a lot of children can actually access states close to these jhanas like it gets very fine-grained but you know states before them just naturally because there's so little conceptual resistance when you're so young you're like a new explorer and seeker just inquiring that concepts drop away and you can merge much more easily with the object and then the taste of that experience it lingers and it's actually what propels you to keep going a lot of the times. Yeah, that's exactly how I felt. I felt like very curious to keep experiencing that because it was something that I couldn't put into mm -hmm. words. And fortunately, I had like I was painting. So I had a, a way to express it to express the experience. Um, and just kind of like, connect with silence, you know, like what we were saying, like what you were describing before with silence is like, there are just a lot of things that we can't say. And that we don't need to, yeah. you know, <laughs> like, like the the deeper feelings that we've had in these experiences is like, it's not something that I think words can really encapsulate. I think words can kind of give you like a roadmap of like, oh, okay, this is kind of like how it was more or less. But yeah, but to just kind of like open ourselves to receive that feeling is very it's just very profound it's very beautiful it is. It's, but on the note of the experience though there's this funny quote not funny i think it's a true quote in zen which is he who experiences satori goes to hell as straight as an arrow satori being like a glimpse of a liberative experience mm -hmm. like these mm -hmm. had like where you're very concentrated and you kind of merge the object a lot of people probably had these the reason being that once you've had that experience, your mind now has the ability to conceptualize it, think about it, crave it, right. desire it. And then that actually becomes a hindrance to you ever going there again. Because now your mind has yeah. an idea of what it should be, of what you're aiming to. And for all these so-called unconditioned states, though that's exactly what hinders it, because then it becomes something conditioned. Yeah, no, I definitely went through that phase as well of just like Same. because you know then it it was i mean it was very early on with my meditation experience so i didn't hold like too much weight on it sure. but there were moments where for example i would be like oh am i like doing this right because like this didn't happen again yeah you know? exactly. and that would yeah field. and like like in the mind just has this natural like desire to kind of improve you know like to create something more efficient save energy things like that you know but mm. but yeah no, no it's true the mind like does it, can <laughs> it comes you. in it, it can help you too 
because I also think yeah. the more details your map of the terrain is, and I see mm -hmm. a lot of Buddhist texts providing maps of the space, then perhaps the more easily you can understand where the landmarks are, where the signposts are, where the dead ends are, like when you've gone the wrong way. A lot of early Buddhist texts, they're super granular in terms of the stages of meditation. You know, there's 16 stages of insight in, you know, Vipassana meditation. When it comes to concentration meditation, they're very specific in terms of like, you concentrate in this way on this object, then you'll arrive at, you know, access concentration and you'll know you're there because these five things are there. And then when these five things or rather five things are not there in access concentration. And then when you reach this next level absorption concentration, these other things arise and they enumerate them. And so very kind of pointed descriptions, which are relevant. I think if you buy the map, like, I feel mm -hmm. like you have to decide, I'm going to trust this map and go with it. And then you do what we, we were talking about earlier, which is then you assign concepts and feelings to, to or rather feelings to concepts. Yeah. And then the map. But if you're like five feet in five different traditions, <laughs> then it's very hard to find a map that makes sense from there. And let alone to actually walk along the path. Right. And, and how did you choose a, a specific tradition I was for like, yourself? Do, do you know Autobiography of a Yogi? Have you read that book? Yes, I've read parts of it. I haven't read the whole thing, though. That was one of my first deep dives. And, and this relates to your question in a second. There, at the end of the book, there was a mail-in pamphlet you could give. So if I mailed it in. And for about a year, I was taking these courses that they would mail me. And it was called Kriya Yoga. And, in, and they would start with like a story, then an exercise. And then one of the stories one day was about digging holes and basically like, don't, don't be satisfied just digging one foot deep spiritual holes. Like finally, if this is the tradition for you, fine, but then dig the hole all the way. And if it's not the tradition, yeah. fine, but then dig the hole all the way. Cause you'll get there if you just pick a place to dig and keep digging. So I didn't stick with that tradition, but then yeah, eventually I just was called to this Vipassana Buddhist style meditation and yeah, just resounded with the teachings or resonated with the teachings resonated with the philosophy and yeah i guess i it picked me i don't know if i picked yeah. it i mean yeah, i feel that. i know that again is like uh right yeah but that is what it feels like no, but, but i mean like of course there are a lot of cliche things but i think a lot of things that are cliche do have a lot of truth in them it's just the context that kind of rubs us the wrong right. way exactly. <laughs> like, and also in hindsight things are always much more clear. Like a narrative is always much more clear in hindsight. Like I'm sure back when I was still seeking, it might not have been as obvious as like, oh, of course, this is the way to go. Because I think moment to moment, I, I don't think we have our larger narrative in view. But I feel like if we look back, it's like, oh yeah, of course this led to this and then this led to this, right? Right, yeah, like things have, there's a sequence, you know, there's a clear yeah. sequence. I mean, can't see it now because we're just 3d beings but if we could see 4d space time maybe we'd see that who knows right and so um in your course or like when you teach meditation to people um do you teach vipassana or do you also teach other types of meditation no. as well no, so just just sort of vipassana slash satipatthana and then anapana so i it, so there's a lecture on virtue and the the importance of developing some virtue precepts some moral precepts and then on concentration, so we deep dive into how do you practice concentration meditation? What are, what are the stages of advancement, right? Like what does success criteria look like in meditation? Like how do you actually know if you're doing it correctly? Which for a lot of people is very hard because as I said before, focus on your breath, what the heck does that mean? And then from there, after like three weeks. So, then, so how do people actually know that they're meditating well or that they're progressing? Yeah, there's these same things that go around like there's no way to meditate incorrectly. It's like, no, there definitely is. Like you can definitely <laughs> hurt, you can definitely hurt yourself meditating yeah. in like a dramatic, you can psychologically hurt yourself. But, but then you can also more minorly just perpetuate greed and delusion and aversion through meditation. I mean, so one of the very simple success criteria for breath meditation is, can you actually hold awareness on the object of meditation for let's say a minute or for 10 breaths? Like, can you count 10 in and out breaths while being distinctly aware of the sensation of the breath. That's a marker of a modicum of progress. But the mm -hmm. main progress is internal. Can you 
bring your mind back from being distracted compassionately every time when it's distracted a thousand times in an hour. <laughs> like every time can you bring it back like, oh, like, oh, without spiraling into self-loathing and self-doubt. That's mm -hmm. a marker of progress as well, right? So there's like two, there's many branches. One is the more pragmatic, can you actually stay on the object? And yeah. Yeah. There, there's more subtle things, like certain things will arise, you know, the body might feel a certain way. Again, the Buddhists have all these technical maps. And so I haven't experienced all of this, but I lay out the maps and I'm like, the maps say that if you've done this for this, this might arise or this might arise and stuff. Cool. And then you certain states, there's these, you know, I mean, these aren't trivial states that anyone can attain, but there's eight jhanas, which are these varying degrees of refined, subtle states of awareness. And yeah, they're, there's very clear indicators of when you've reached one of these, how it feels and so on. So outline all of that. And then, yeah, you transition to insight practice, which is the point of Buddhist meditation. Because lots of people in ancient India <coughs> had concentration meditation. They where they got these absorption states, but what they didn't have was insight practice. They found that no matter how high up you get in meditation, you'd still come down. Like no matter how mm -hmm. Once you stop meditating, since certain states are conditioned, you'd come back to normal. The Buddha was like, no, how can I use my sharp mind to once and for all cut the root of suffering? And that's what insight meditation is about. It's about fundamentally becoming comfortable with uncertainty, comfortable with impermanence, and reorienting your view that, hey, the phenomena that are occurring, they don't belong to me. There is the need to begin with, and that is dissected and examined through the body mind system it's not like an abstract process it's what we spoke about earlier body sensation thought forms and so on right and so that and then how that tradition that original kind of teaching of vipassana anapana they call it how that evolved in sort of the second iteration of buddhism because there they there was an evol there was kind of three evolutions in buddhist history you could say from theravada to mahayana from mahayana to sort of vajrayana and what were the conceptual evolutions and what stayed the same? Because, you know, in Tibetan Buddhism, in the Vajrayana, they say it's a faster path to liberation, but it's a more dangerous path. And so what does that even mean? How can a path be more dangerous, but faster? And so, yeah, and those are teachings that I don't practice myself, but I give a great sort of conceptual overview of them. And so what do they mean by more dangerous? Yeah, yeah so the, you're the very energies that you're trying to in, in essence in early Buddhism you're trying to not give into craving you're also not trying to give into certain urges right like definitely monks don't have sex for instance sexual energy is a very powerful distractor in Vajrayana Buddhism there's a lot of practices where you use the energy of craving since it's so natural and the energy of sexuality it's so natural it arises naturally you use it towards liberation but that means that it's a very fine line between using it towards liberation and just deluding yourself and becoming a hedonist, yeah. for instance. So it's dangerous right. and you can easily self-delude. And then other practices involve sort of creating very ornate visualizations, imbuing those visualizations with certain qualities, and then merging yourself with those visualizations and becoming that which you visualize, which can be very psychologically destabilizing if you haven't grasped certain preliminary teachings. Mm -hmm. Why, in the old days, I think it's less so now, a lot of those lineages of Vajrayana Buddhism, they were just that, lineages that you could only be initiated if you'd done the necessary prerequisite trainings. And you had a guru with you as well, right? There's a lot of unique features of Vajrayana Buddhism that differentiate it from this early Theravada Buddhism, they call it. But yeah, so more dangerous for those reasons, I'd say. But, yeah. you know, infinitely fascinating. The artwork, Definitely. Rubin Museum that I'll shout out again in New York. It's <laughs> yeah, fascinating place. Tibetan art is one of my favorites. But yeah, these are practices I definitely don't engage in because, I mean, you hear a lot of tantric this, tantric that these days, but that, that hurts me. Because if you're really a tantric practitioner, you've spent decades on the preliminary practices, which are like breath yeah. meditation, mantra meditation. Everyone wants to do all that you know, tantric sex, tantric yoga. It's like, no, the practitioners of that 
practice the the stuff you don't want to do for decades. Exactly. And, and you have to have a guru. Like there's all these preliminaries. And so, yeah, it's unfortunate that the word tantric has been kind of co-opted in modernity. Oh, thank you so much for saying that. Like, I really appreciate you saying that because it does happen a lot. You know, like I have seen it a lot, um, particularly for people who are, you know, like recently exploring their own spirituality or connecting with their body, their breath, meditation, these types of things. Like there are so many, many of these kinds of distractions or traps, you know, yeah. um, or just manipulative people that get into the space <laughs> and the unfortunately good like of, of course you're going to listen to the teacher who says you don't have to sit every day and focus on your breath you can in fact follow all your urges it's like yeah of course i'll listen to that because that sounds way better than the initial friction you'll feel when you're trying to develop a regular sit or grappling with you know complicated buddhist concepts and so on right and yeah. then, your exciting course coming up as well. Oh no, but first I wanted to ask you, I have one, I have another question. Um, I wanted to know, so like when you teach people meditation or when they move through your course, what kind of changes do you see in them? That is, yeah, that, that's a really cool question. Yeah, so, but a question on my mind of like, I needed to get it out. <laughs> like, so yeah, it was at, at first in the course I taught in person last year, there was a lot of I, uh, people, I made a, an intake form for people and a lot of people had very high, high expectations in terms of what this practice would do to you. And I made sure to explain to them that there's a domain within which this technique is applicable yeah. and there's a domain it is not applicable. But then at the end, I found out that just because they brought the intention to it, it actually had a lot of transformative effects to them. So some of the teachings resonated a lot with people. There was a teaching on yeah, it is quite complicated. The teachings of emptiness resonated with people. The teachings of suchness resonated with people, which is essentially more conceptually sophisticated versions of impermanence. You can think about it. So the concept of impermanence resonated with people a lot. And then the practices to embody that resonated with people a lot because many people had practiced breath meditation before. Not many had practiced this body sensation investigation that we explored. And so they were really surprised in a lot of ways by what came up when they just sit and they observe sensations and surprised at the simplicity of the teachings and that when they're applied correctly, there's just a great relief that's felt, right? And, and some of them have even reached out after the course and were like, can you keep sending some teachings and some readings and stuff? Obviously, when I say send teachings, not my teachings, like sending readings, yeah, send, of course. sending all sorts of texts that I found and... Yeah, so, so a lot of positivity, but, but it's tricky. Like it definitely takes, you know, you get what you give. The techniques are simple if mm -hmm. you practice them correctly. And all I can do is, from my understanding, explain here's how you do it correctly. Here's how you do it incorrectly. Like for an example of incorrectly would be when you're observing sensations in the body. If you're craving pleasant sensations and you're wishing, oh, I want to feel good. I wish this pain in my knee would go away. That's opposite. You're doing the wrong thing. Yeah. That is unequivocally not the technique, <laughs> right? Because then you're just continually building your conditioned tendency to seek out pleasurable things and have aversion towards unpleasant things. Mm -hmm. But that's much, much more subtle than it seems when you're actually sitting with, let's say, a pain and it's 50 minutes into a meditation, right? Like, what, is, sure. what is the line, right? So, <laughs> so that's what I can find. I can say, hey, I've taken two steps on this path, so I can at least tell you what's behind me on these two steps. And what I just have endless questions. Like there's so many questions I have. Um, what words of caution do you have for anyone who's practicing meditation alone at home or things like that? Oh, to go, go, go really slow. Be so gentle with yourself. Don't practice if you have PTSD that's active or any re like, you know, latent psychological, I don't like if you have schizophrenia in your family and if it's reared its head recently and PTSD especially is one of the sort of contraindications to meditation because then you, you just can't sit and it's yeah. not a, a little thing. It's just your body is asking for something else, another type of technique to liberate you. Right. So, so I'd say certainly that is something you shouldn't do. And that's a caution. 
and be gentle with yourself with regards to make sure there's a way you can exit a meditation and be immediately comforted. Mm. If you experience, and one day maybe you go on a retreat where you can't do that. But if you're building up to that, make sure that if you're in a meditation and you need, and things are arising, both physical and mental that you cannot deal with, that you have a plan to exit. Like let's say you have your bed all set up with some music and some snacks and you can immediately enter a nice situation that could maybe distract you, that could comfort you and so on. And yeah, finding your edge, but don't go an inch beyond your edge. Yeah, I really, I love what you're saying because um, like I have, I've worked with clients who have like specific traumas or I wouldn't say that they've had PTSD, but they have, you know, a, a form of complex trauma, which means like trauma that has been present over, over a long time where they felt very unsafe in their environment, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so in this time where everyone's a self, like a wellness, self-help <laughs> influencer, whatever, right? Um, like these people have tried meditation I don't know what form of it. I don't know from who, like whatever, right? Um, <laughs> but, you know, I've had, or like they've tried these like alternative practices or things like that. And, you know, they come to me with the sense of like, you know, or I had one client, for example, tell me, oh, but I really feel like I just need to forgive this person. And I was like, but if you're angry, like if you genuinely feel angry, you need to feel angry first. Like, how can you forgive someone if you haven't, really felt that emotion and really released that emotion like are you forgiving yourself because you feel like you have to because you feel like it's virtuous because it makes you a better person you know and so i think it's just like really cool that you mention you know if you have ptsd or if you have some form of complex trauma maybe meditation isn't the right step for you at this moment you know i think a lot of people need to know that because like at a time where there's just so much access to information and like so many random people are just like giving out whatever information about whatever yeah. <laughs> it's like like please like don't like don't go into meditation as With caution. like these, these techniques some of these are no joke and that yeah. breath meditation because it's you know everyone has access to the breath and it's very hard to you know take it too far at the beginning but yeah seek out a sangha a community read the yeah. try to get information from the source honestly like like don't, yeah like there's all these great popular books which are awesome but eventually you know go go to the old school texts that have survived thousands of years of you know that people have safeguarded that people broke their backs to translate you know yeah. like all the modern writings are awesome as someone who writes modern things like of course for sure I, I think I'm, I enjoy what I do, but yeah, the source is there. Like these are the things that liberated people, the people of old and translating it into common language is great, but, but how does it look like in the old, in the old speak, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think like, I think it's very beautiful what you're doing. And I think it's beautiful that you're talking about this in modern terms, um, like to, to access people, you know, on like a more like understandable level, you of course, know? But but yeah, <laughs> holding the sources too. Like I'm, I'm very big in, like a, a lot of the early Buddhist um, writings. There's like, I could go on forever. But there's the the suttas. There's three baskets of early Buddhist uh, texts called the Pali Canon, and one of them is the sort of the the Sutta Pitaka, which is the discourses of the Buddha. And I love quoting those discourses in my course. But I always patient because I want people to be able to go read it themselves. Yeah. And yeah, uh -huh. and. Originally, these were all memorized, so they're quite formulaic. Some of them are not very poetic and nice, but this is the, the corpus of early Buddhism, right? This, this is the source. All other Buddhist traditions kind of stem from there. So I think it's important that if people are going down this path, they at least know, like, what's the core text? People know in Christianity, like, it's the Bible. Yeah. Right? A lot of people, if you ask them in Buddhism, like, what are the texts that are at the center of it? What's the Bible of Buddhism? It's like... I wouldn't draw that exact comparison, but yeah, there are texts that are, that every type of Buddhism would say, oh yeah, we would point to these texts as being source material, right? Like these are primary sources. Yeah, I, I just, I love that you're mentioning all of this because, you know, I've just observed other people in this sense, like, you know, if you're looking for something, if you're seeking something, if you're seeking a sense of greater depth in 
life or connection or fulfillment or things like that when you're vulnerable it's very easy for you to take whatever information comes your way yeah you know and i've had i've had people come to me like feeling you know hurt or upset by by information just information that they had received that sent them spiraling you know and made them feel like oh but now i'm supposed to do this or like what if this practice doesn't work for me like nothing is a one size fits all thing and so i just want to mention like if you're if you're going towards spirituality as like a solution or you know some sort of uh like some sort of con consolence, you know, through maybe traumatic or difficult experiences you've had. Air with caution, <laughs> you know, like something that I just wanna say is that you really cannot compare yourself to other people. Like your nervous system is wired in a different way than other people, depending on the experiences that you've had, the environment that you grew up in. So you will naturally respond like what we talked about before, like we could experience the same thing and respond in very different ways. And so I just want to say that, you know, like in a time where like, I think like even meditation is getting watered down and like these things are just being thrown around all the time. Like these are very, very um, like these teachings are very deep. They're rooted in cultures. They're rooted in time. They're rooted in many people who have worked through them through generations you know uh -huh. so i just want to say like if if anyone watching this feels you know like you're looking like you're seeking for something you want some sort of answer go to the source like you said you know but also really listen to your body <laughs> like and if you don't know how to listen to your body just like when, when something feels really bad stop <laughs> like don't yeah. like don't go into like the mental comparing of like oh but my friend can do this or like oh this random like whatever spiritual person guru told me that I should be able to do this. Like, no, they don't know you. No. They don't have the experiences that you have. Um, there are, you know, experiences and emotions that live within your body that your mind isn't even aware of. So yeah, I just, I just wanted to say that because I think it's a really important point. I think, and, and then to piggyback off that, I mean, two, two points I'd make. One is that getting it from the source is important because everyone's heard of mindfulness, yeah. but on the Buddhist path of liberation, it's an eightfold path. Mindfulness is one of eight. No one talks about the others. You'll only hear right. mindfulness training, but they've plucked that out of the context of this eightfold path of training. But that doesn't live alone. You can't get, like, they all support it. It's a path. Yeah. It's a spiral path, right? You need all of the elements, right? Mm -hmm. So mindfulness, no one really talks about the virtue trainings. If you're gonna practice the Buddhist path as a dedicated practitioner, you can't drink alcohol, for instance. No one definitely, not many people talk about that part. Taking the precepts, you can't lie, you can't steal, you can't kill. I mean, yeah, hopefully we don't do all those very often, but but there's a lot of other nuances to the path and mindfulness is the one that's become very sexy. And as we talked about earlier, even the word mindfulness, sati, it, there's contention in, in what exactly it means, right? In terms of the translations. And then the other point I was gonna make for some people looking for spirituality as an answer, Spirituality is very important, but there's but maybe you might need to get other things in order first if you're you're not going to feel at ease on the cushion if you're financially unstable worrying about a paycheck if your room's a mess like you might have to get other things in order first to be able to have a foundation. The reason monks can meditate is because well, they don't worry about food, they have meal times, they have a house, they have like everything there's a lot of stability in their life, so building that stability in a non-spiritual sense, in a material sense, first is important. Yeah. I used to, you know, think that the sacred and the and the mundane were at odds with each other, where I'm like, oh, it's all spiritual, no, no practical. But it's like, no, yeah. these, like the- I think that's a phase. I think everyone has that phase at some point, right? <laughs> totally, where it's like you abandon material, but then you're like, oh wait, well, I'm embodied. I need to care about this stuff. I need to get things in order at this level first and then i can progress because you know this is this beautiful body of we all have the, this is the container for spiritual experience exactly if we, both physically in terms of what we eat the fitness we partake in but also mentally like the stress of is there stability enough stability in our lives yeah you're not going to make much progress on the cushion because every time you sit you'll be anxious about xyz 
Right. Yeah, exactly. And and I think it's important to to prioritize having those things in order and to see that as a part of your spirituality, not as something separate, you know, not as like, oh, you know, getting your finances in that order in order is like at at conflict with your spirituality, you exactly, know, like, exactly. like like everything's an opportunity, you know, everything's an opportunity for you to express who you are as a spirit, as what your essence is, you know, yeah. like even in those difficult moments, like you can always choose how you respond and how you show up. And even Buddhism, they have, like right livelihood is one of the eight factors of the Eightfold Path. So they've accounted for, like this path is also for lay people, right? Which is, you know, non-ordained men and women. Like, yeah, there are livelihoods. And, you know, Buddhism is so like cut and, not cut and dry, but it's very clear that, yeah, some things will lead you towards awakening. Some things will lead you away from awakening. And they don't shy away from saying, this is how it is. Like there are livelihoods. If you engage in these, you're going further away from the path and so on. It's, and I love, and they don't say these as ultimate categorizations of reality. They say these as, they call it kusala and akusala, skillful and unskillful. So this gets you here. We're not saying it's better or worse than anything else. We're just saying that it will get you in this way. In the same way that if I'm reaching for my coffee mug, reaching towards it gets me towards it, reaching away it gets it away. You know, yeah. like just in that sense. Wow. I'm just like, there's just so much that we covered in these past couple of hours. You were like, I, we're going to talk for like two hours. I was like, and when you said that, I was like, I'm not sure if we're going to talk for two hours, but we definitely <laughs> not, I'm gonna have an early night. We're going to have a quick chat, but as usual, we just kind of like absolutely smiled. Wait, quickly. I want to hear about the, your course coming up. Yeah, okay, so my course is actually really, um, something that we mentioned earlier was really like connected to it. I don't remember exactly. Ah, yeah, we talked about unconditional love and we talked about how, you know, sometimes unconditional love expresses itself in painful ways, you know, ways that don't feel comfortable, at least, mm -hmm. you know. And so, yeah, my program is a lot about that. You know, it's about really prioritizing, um, you know, relationships and finding relationships from um oh someone left a comment i didn't even see that thank you so much for that comment very true maslow's hierarchy um yeah so basically yeah the whole concept is about you know calling in people who deeply understand you based off of your self-expression rather than approaching relationships and not just i'm not talking about romantic relationships particularly um the program is more focused on just like relationships in general like friendships, collaborations, networking, like whatever networking, you know, like just connecting with people um, and kind of seeing what flows from there, you know, <laughs> like not going in with any kind of expectation. Um, and yeah, like the whole, the, the whole purpose of it is because like over the years, I've heard a lot of people say to me things like, no one understands me where I live or, you know, I'm, I'm delving into these like spiritual, you know, experiences within myself, I'm connecting with my emotions, with my body, like no one really understands. And so it's kind of to change that perception of like, this being an external thing to it being an internal thing, you know, of like, actually, there are people who will understand you. <laughs> um, but they can't find you if they can't see you, uh -huh. you know, and so like, if you're not showing up, like, you know, if you feel constricted, if you feel like, you know, no one understands, me so therefore you show up in a constricted way then you'll keep attracting people who are like that because that's how people kind of see you you know it is possible as well that someone sees your depth and they kind of like bring that out of you um but i think in most cases people stay in this loop of like i feel very alone especially you know in modern <laughs> society modern times um because yeah, there there are these kinds of like barriers and conditions in a lot of in particular countries, but you know, more so, I think, internally, you know, I think internally, we have a lot of walls up to receiving love. Um, and just like connecting from like a human space, you know, and I think even that thought of like, oh, these people don't understand me. It's like, well, do they have to under like, do you even fully understand yourself? You know, like, exactly. <laughs> Like, is it even really possible for someone to fully understand you? You know, I think it very much comes from this concept of like, in order to connect, we have to agree 
but we really don't have to agree like we can very easily disagree but we can still appreciate that we have a connection you know mm -hmm. so so yeah that's kind of like the the intention the focus of the program just to kind of give people that empowerment of like you don't have have to show up in this constricted way you don't have to just wait to be around your best friends in order to express yourself the way that you feel in the moment um like you can go up to random people and talk to them like you can just go into new places where you don't know anyone like you don't have to have all of these conditions right <laughs> like all of these conditions <laughs> around how you show up in the was very much focused on self-expression and you know working with color and art therapy as a means to release kind of all the release those conditions and also like release those those kind of like embodied experiences of like oh i'm not good enough i shouldn't express myself here if i express myself someone might hurt me um i'm unsafe you know it's like we're working with those tools to kind of release those feelings and give people the sense of like yeah i can show up as i am and like like really kind of embody the self-expression in the sense of like you're meant to express yourself it's your nature to express yourself you know like i always think of um self-expression like flowers mm. like they just blossom <laughs> they show up they're not worried about like oh am i too pink today or like but that flower is blue like is pink uglier than blue you know like so just kind of really um working with the body to just to feel this sense of nature, like this sense of joy and just being how you are and expressing yourself. So yeah, that's kind Beautiful. of the, the Beautiful. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. It reminded me of this, the last part about the flower, I think it's so great. But this Ram Dass quote, where it's like, you wouldn't go into a forest and like criticize the trees like, Oh, you're too, you're too curly. You're too tall. You're too this, you're too that. Oh, thank you. In the bottom, Annie, thank, thank you, so, you much. so much. Much, Annie. <laughs> this message is so beautiful. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for joining us on this, on this very, so sweet. very long odyssey of a call. We really appreciated you, <laughs> and I've seen your name pop up so frequently on my feed. So, thank you for following, and yeah, I hope we can have some exchanges. Oh, oh my gosh! There's been so much love, like so many comments, and like people staying and people coming in. Like we haven't been alone in this two hour this two hour adventure <laughs> absolutely not but on that note i mean i as usual i i don't want to call it but the kids need me tomorrow morning yeah <laughs> no, i've been no. thinking about that too this this was wonderful well thank you to everyone who joined this this was a lot of fun yeah we should, we should definitely yeah. do this again this was wonderful this was so, so wonderful but yeah Let's, uh, I don't know how to end or repost this. So I leave it to you, Kelly. Yeah, since I started the live, I just end it and then I add you as a collaborator. It'll be on both of our pages. So um, okay. just so that people know, you'll find it on both. <laughs> Amazing. All right, well, on that note, have an awesome night, everyone. Susan, so thank great to hear from you. you. Susan. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoy Thank you so much. I hope you're at the cottage everybody. this summer. Or I hope you were there last summer as well. <laughs> All right. Take care, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much. Bye. Ciao. <laughs> so.